Hey there, Mr. Redder here. Welcome back to another episode of Reddit Podcast Stories, where today, Karen flips out in our restaurant because we only carry Coke and not Pepsi. I was serving Saturday night at a pretty popular burger chain. I got set with a five top of all adults who were nice considering it was too early for dinner rush and I could give them almost my full attention. I greet them and start getting their drinks. The last person to order a drink was a woman probably in her 50s. She seemed really sweet at first when she asked, Do you have Pepsi or Coke? I explained that we carry Coke products and then it was like a flip switched. Why does every darn restaurant have to carry Coke? That doesn't make sense. Coke products are all terrible. I can't stand them. I was completely shocked at her reaction to be honest. She ranted for a full 30 seconds. She wasn't fully yelling but basically talking as loud as she could. Before I could answer, one of the guys at her table replied, Coke is popular, that's why, and he laughed awkwardly. I spoke up and I offered the many other drinks that we carry that aren't soda, but she just scrunched up her nose in disgust and settled on a Sprite. I can't stand Sprite, but I'm going to have to force it down now, thanks to useless restaurants that can't carry Pepsi. Okay, ma'am, whatever you say. I brought her a Sprite and she drank three of them. Must not have been too bad. I don't know what changed because the rest of the night she was on her best behavior. She loved the food, thanked me a lot, and left me a great tip. A win is a win. What I would like to assume happened is that the other four people at her table shamed her for her outburst and she was so embarrassed that she acted on her best behavior for the rest of the night. Good grief. I get that people prefer one over the other, but reacting like that? Get a life, lady. Order water, coffee, or tea if it's that big of a deal. Anyone who gets this angry about a soft drink should be drinking more water anyways. Honestly, it's very telling that us servers are always checking with these people to see if Pepsi is okay, like their kids about to have a temper tantrum. I've never had a temper tantrum, but I have always been appreciative when I order a Jack and Coke and the server asks me if Pepsi is okay. It absolutely is not. I always have a backup, Jack and Ginger, so no big deal. I went to a concert a few weeks ago and I ordered a double Jack and Coke, which cost me $32. I knew how much it was and I still ordered it. I was not happy that I got a Jack and Pepsi. I kept thinking it tasted funny. Yeah, because that venue only carries Pepsi products. For $32, the bartender should have absolutely specified that it was Pepsi. Any place that serves alcohol should carry Coke products. A rum and Pepsi or a Jack and Pepsi should just be illegal. Well, what do you think is better? Coke or Pepsi? Please let us know. Can we all just agree that Diet Pepsi is absolutely disgusting, but Coke Zero? Mmm, I dream about this stuff. My fiancé wants to be a stay-at-home fiancé. Is she a gold digger? My fiancé has proposed something to me that I've never heard of. We had a big argument and she felt that I was acting like a jerk. So, I wanted to get an opinion on what she's asking me and if it's something that I should be worried about. I, 30 male, Recently got engaged to my fiance, Emma, who's 26 last month. Emma is amazing and we met at work. I'm a researcher in a big tech firm while Emma works in marketing. We met two and a half years ago during a company event and I was completely smitten by her. I asked her out, she said yes, and we have an amazing relationship so far. One of the things I love about Emma is how organized she is. Her job involves working on marketing events and event planning. She's great at it and I'm so proud of her. However, her work also involves working for longer hours, especially if she's helping in organizing events or meetups. Since my job is a desk job, I generally have very predictable hours and I do not generally have to work late. She always complains about how I get to sit in a nice office while she's driving around everywhere and getting things done. I know this might come off poorly, but I am neurodivergent, ADD, and I struggle with simple things and that's one of the reasons I love her as I struggle with anything that requires organization. She's patient and makes my life better in many ways. We moved in together in the summer. She moved into my apartment. That was the first time we discussed finances openly. Due to some really lucky factors and stock value appreciation, I have a pretty good compensation package. She knew I was financially stable, but she was shocked when she learned what I make. I was actually equally shocked at what she makes. It turns out I was making around 15 times more than her. I offered her to not pay anything and concentrate on saving to pay back her student debt, which was paused at the time. I own our apartment. 
However, she said that she also wanted to contribute and we decided to split the expenses proportional to what we make, which I thought was fair. She has always been very independent and self-sufficient. Now onto the issue. So we got engaged around a month ago during the holidays. She had never asked me for anything expensive before. However, she wanted a specific diamond engagement ring that cost us close to $15,000. I was not comfortable spending that, but she convinced me that she was going to wear it for the rest of her life, and hence, it's worth it. We got it, and she was very happy. Whenever she shows the ring to anyone, she often attempts to mention the cost of the ring in the conversation. I feel extremely uncomfortable with showing off, and I have told her many times to stop. However, she continues doing it. Yesterday, I came home, and she asked me to sit on the couch next to her. She said she wanted to talk about something important. She said that she's planning to quit her job next month and give her 15-day notice. I was shocked and asked her if anything was wrong. She said that she wants to plan the wedding and it's going to take a lot of time. We plan to get married in the summer. Hence, she wants to make sure she takes care of all of the booking soon. I asked her why she needed to quit her job for that and she said that she was tired of working long hours and wanted to be a stay-at-home fiancé. I laughed and told her that that was not a thing. Plus, she still has tens of thousands of dollars of student loans. She argued that it was less than what I make in a month and we are a team now, so she's not worried about it. I asked her what her plans were after the wedding and she said that she had not planned what to do after that but was glad I was with her. I told her that she could take a break but I'm not comfortable with her just abandoning her career at such a young age, especially since we're not planning to have kids for at least a few years. She's good at what she does and I want her to be independent even after marriage, in case something bad happens to me. We had a big argument and she feels that I'm a jerk to want her to work after marriage when we can afford for her to stay at home. On one hand, what she makes is not going to affect our finances. However, it just rubbed me the wrong way. I've never heard of anyone leaving their job to plan a wedding. Is stay-at-home fiancé really a thing? I want to support her and make her life comfortable, but I feel quitting her career is a little too early for her age. Nobody is a jerk here. You just need to go to counseling and iron out how finances work and are going to look in your marriage. Example, do you want to fully support her? If so, great. Or not. These are make or break things in a marriage. Better to work them out now. OP. Thanks. She has a college degree and I really want her to not be codependent on me. This can be addressed in counseling or more communication. Not the jerk. The fact that she went from an independent, capable adult to wanting to be your dependent after she found out how much you make is a huge concern. If she was willing to throw away her own career for this perceived easy life, that doesn't bode well for if she'll stick with you if you ever lost the ability to pull such a high salary. OP. What concerned me was that she waited until we got engaged and then told me about this. I just wanted opinions on if anyone else has observed this and what they did to deal with it. Update. On Friday night, we ordered in and had a nice dinner. I again brought up the subject of why she wanted to quit her job. I tried to be supportive and not act like a jerk when asking the questions. Initially, she went all defensive about why she wanted to stay home and started talking about how it would not matter since she barely made enough to contribute to our relationship. I tried to explain it to her that it was not about just the money. I told her how hardworking and talented she is in her field and she has worked very hard to finally get a position where she's helping with the event management for such a large organization. I also talked about the fact that although I make good money, I've just been working for a few years and we do not have enough savings where if something happens to me, she will be taken care of. I told her about my fears that having a large salary means I have the biggest target on my back when it comes to layoffs. Overall, I think I was able to get my point across on why I feel she should not give up on her career at the age of 26. She agreed with most of the things I said. She told me that she was very overwhelmed with all of the things that needed to be done before our wedding. She commented on how I am really bad at organizing tasks and she will have to handle many of the things on her own. Our parents insist that we get married this year and it's a very short time frame to plan everything. She said that she feels burnt out at work and barely has any energy left at the end of the week after running around everywhere and sometimes traveling to different cities. Her exact complaint was her boss treated her like a work mule and it was degrading to do all of that work for barely any money. Hence, she wants to avoid the work stress and plan for the wedding from a happy place. She promised that she would start looking for work once we were done with our wedding and honeymoon trip. However, she does not want to work in a role she is currently working in and wants a job with more predictable hours. She also talked about going back to school and getting her master's. 
She insisted that she did not want to be a trophy wife and I jokingly pointed out that the best she would qualify for would be a consolation trophy. She laughed, but I don't think she was happy with that. I think that was fair and she plans to resign later this week. Hopefully, she will be able to enjoy the days off and re-energize before the wedding. As for all the gold digger comments, I understand where you're coming from. I grew up poor and I make an effort to never show off what I have to a fault because not everyone in my family has got what I have. She fell into that version of me. If I trust her enough to get married to her, then I also have to trust my perception of her. For me, she's the smartest, hardest working, independent person who frankly does not care about stuff. Granted, she got a nice engagement ring and was excited to show it off. However, most of my colleague spouses also have nicer rings. 15 times? So if she makes 40,000, he makes 600,000? Either she is super underpaid or OP is actually rich. Those numbers seem weird to me. Yeah, the numbers are pretty bonkers. I know everyone is saying she's a gold digger, but if I was working a stressful job and making 1 15th the amount of my spouse while planning a wedding on short notice and also managing a lot of my fiancé's life for him due to his ADHD, that's a difference in pay where it seems reasonable to wonder, if I take over the domestic tasks instead of being at work, can I support my spouse in his career so that my drop in the financial ocean is not missed at all, but instead works towards greater dividends? But even more than that, did mom and dad buy OP a company to be CEO at or what? Because that pay disparity at this early career stage is really something. I can totally see her being burnt out. I've known a few Emma types and because they are natural organizers, they do tend to end up taking on more of the burden, particularly when those around them need the assistance. My BFF is one. She worked for a lady who was very senior but incredibly flaky and I remember her complaining that she was making one-tenth what her manager did but also had ended up doing both her work and a large part of her manager's too because of her incredible efficiency. She has a degree and works long hours in marketing and he makes 15 times more? Like, what could that even be? 50,000 and 750,000? Like, yeah, that would make working tough being married to that. It would all seem so pointless. And then OP also expects that she take over all the emotional labor since he's so bad in planning. His parents also push for a wedding this year. I would be so upset, working long hours in a crappy job, and then I come home finding my relaxed fiancé, who's been home for hours since he works a 9-to-5 desk job for 15 times my salary. And then I should also take over the planning? Heck no. I want to know so badly how they split the chores. I think buried in here somewhere may be a valid point about how it sounds like the fiancé is taking all of the emotional labor for the household on and she's exhausted with having to juggle a demanding job with organizing OP's life for him as well. Oh, I'm so bad at organizing things and she's so good at it has been the excuse of every lazy partner and spouse since the dawn of time. She's not a conniving gold digger. She's burnt out. Her job is long hours managing events, then she gets home and it sounds like she also manages his life. I mean, if your fiancé was making 15 times the same money as you for far less hours, I'd also prefer doing literally anything other than work because it basically means my work has no value. Am I the jerk has such weird energy. This dude is basically part of the 1% and the comments are calling his fiancé a gold digger because she doesn't want to work while taking on the lion's share of the household tasks even though she has a more physically and mentally challenging job than he does, and also got with him when she thought he was earning modest wages. I would bet my life that the keyboard warriors telling OP to get a prenup would act like they hit the jackpot if they found out the love of their life was secretly rich. Well, who do you think is the jerk? OP or his fiance? Please let us know. All I can say is good luck, brother. Something tells me you're gonna need it. Am I the jerk for refusing to babysit last minute because their sons seem older than they said they were? I, 19 female, have been babysitting occasionally for a few families for the past two years. A week ago, a new family got my number from one of the families that I babysit for often. I told them up front that I have this rule where I only babysit boys that are 10 and under, but when it comes to girls, the age is not an issue for me. They told me that they had two boys, ages 9 and 10, so I agreed. They told me that they had very important plans the day I was to babysit and I assured them that I am very professional and I will be there on time and all of that. The day came and I went to their house and the dad greeted me then took me to their living room to meet the boys. To my surprise, 
They looked like no 9 or 10 year old that I've ever met. One looked 12 and the other looked like he could be 15 or even 16. Both were taller than me and the older one even had some visible facial hair. All that was going through my head was that these parents lied to me about the ages because I lead with my rule about ages and they lied to me just so I would accept. When the mother came down and greeted me, I asked to speak with her in another room and I told her I cannot babysit. I was also truthful about the reason and she was livid. We got into a back and forth where I basically said that I feel they lied to me about the ages and she even said, Oh, so you want me to show you their birth certificates to believe me? At this point, I was kind of mad because she was immediately livid and I also felt like I was fooled. Anyways, I said, yeah, some proof would help. She stomped off to the living room and I could hear her tell her husband, get this jerk out of my house. I'll stay with the boys. I walked out of the kitchen towards the front door and announced, I'm leaving before I stepped out. Later that night, the mom of the family who recommended me called and was also pretty angry. I explained that they looked much older than they said they were, and there was no way that they weren't lying. She said maybe one is actually 11, but the other is truly 9, and that they just look like they were much older. To be fair, the mother was tall and the dad was huge. It's actually the reason I asked to confront the mother and not the father. But boys weren't just tall, they also looked older facial-wise. Also, if I had babysat them, I wouldn't have felt safe, which is why I have the rule in the first place. There was no way their mother didn't realize that they looked much older. I feel like it was something she should have mentioned after telling her my rule about their ages. I felt like I was justified, but I also felt bad that I ruined their plans. Everyone involved is angry with me, and I wonder if maybe I was overreacting and should have just babysat since I agreed. Right now, I don't know what to think. Was I the jerk here? No. If she could have shown you their birth certificates as offered, she would have. And they could have been fake. How would a 19-year-old even know if they were real? But facial hair? That's a no from me. Not the jerk. Not the jerk. I'm so impressed that you stood up for yourself like that. Your gut is usually right, and you are wise to trust it. Dude, you just accused the parents of lying, called these kids threats, and acted as though you were being somehow set up. No wonder the less tall and therefore able to be spoken to parent was livid. My kid was taller than me by the time she was nine. The world can be unforgiving to a kid who looks older and thus is treated as older than they are. Thanks for contributing to that unwarranted shame. If you're so frightened of kids, then don't babysit. If you have to physically restrain them, then don't babysit. And if you think that all young men are threats, then get therapy. Just when I thought I had heard everything, your boundary is tall kids. You are the jerk. Am I the jerk for getting my neighbor and client banned by all of the local babysitters? Over the holidays, I, female 17, got a chance to go to the Caribbean with my neighbors as their nanny. My parents weren't thrilled, but it was after Christmas so they let me go. The deal was pretty simple. It was 10 days at an all-inclusive resort. I would share a room with the kids and take care of them for 7 days and 7 nights, and in return I got $500 and 3 days to myself. The rooms were adjoining, I think that's the right word, a door joined them. My parents insisted I get everything in writing so there were no mistakes. Basically, we agreed that I would work two days and take one day off, over and over. No problem, I thought, and I checked out the included activities and any excursions I might like. On my third day off, I had planned to go scuba diving. I got up early and went on my excursion. When I got back, the parents were mad that I had left without warning. I reminded them that we had a deal and they said that they had met another couple there and they were going golfing and that I messed up their plans. I don't know why they made plans on one of my free days. They were upset all the way home and when we got back, they posted about how irresponsible I was. One of the other families called me to get my side of the story. I sent them a picture of the deal that we agreed on. They said they knew I wouldn't do what I was being accused of. Then they started commenting on the post by my neighbors. My parents did that also, but I think everyone thought that they were just protecting me. So now it's a big deal and everyone knows that they tried to change our deal without talking to me. Some of the other babysitters, or their parents, are now saying that they won't babysit for my neighbors anymore. I feel bad about it because they paid a lot for my vacation, and if they had asked, I probably would have switched my excursion to the next day. Anyways, they're upset that I told, which I didn't. They said that I could have talked to them if I had a problem, but I'm not the one who made it public. Not the jerk. You made an agreement in writing which they insisted on. 
Am I the jerk for refusing to pay for cake slices that my teenage daughter ate? I, female 38, am a single mom with my teenage daughter, Carly, who's 17. My sister, who's 36, lives nearby with her husband and their two kids, who are 9 and 7. Carly sometimes babysits her cousins on the weekends, so my sister and brother-in-law can go out, usually for 3 to 4 hours. In exchange, my sister gives her 30 to 40 euros, cash in hand. My sister and I do not make Carly babysit. She volunteers to. She likes having the extra money to fund her Starbucks addiction without a part-time job in fast food or retail. Plus, the kids love getting to see her. I'm glad that she's getting to learn responsibility. I think it's a win all around. Last weekend, there was a problem. A couple hours after Carly came home from babysitting, my sister calls me. It was my niece's birthday two-ish weeks ago, and there was some leftover birthday party cake in the kitchen. It was a custom-made fancy lemon curd cake, and I remember at the party, a lot of the kids didn't want to eat it, so there was a lot left over. While she was babysitting, Carly had eaten two slices. My sister said that she should have asked before helping herself to the cake and that it was expensive. I apologized to my sister and told her that I would have a word with my daughter. She mentions again that the cake was custom made and expensive and says that we should be compensating her. At first, I honestly thought she couldn't be serious, but she did want me to give her money because of the cake. I mentioned that surely the cake is going bad soon if it isn't already stale. I said this lightheartedly, trying to lighten the mood, but I made it clear I'm not giving her money. She says she paid 70 euros for the cake and she expects me to give her 20 euros. I told her I'm not doing that. My sister says that I'm being inconsiderate and that my daughter ate the slices without permission. I feel like she's being petty and what difference would it have made if all of it had been eaten last weekend at the party? Am I the jerk for refusing to pay her for the cake? Pay your sister for the two slices of her fancy cake and tell your daughter she will no longer be babysitting for them without full and comparable to other sitters' compensation ever again, and tell her why. Your sister had the golden goose of babysitters, and she obviously had no idea how good she had it. Emphasis on had. If she wants to nickel and dime you, let's go. And don't bother to give sister a heads up. She can find out your daughter will be charging her, shall we say, 20 euros an hour? For every hour? Or whatever the going rate is. Or she can scramble to find an alternative. Your daughter could make all kinds of money for her Starbucks addiction, working for somebody else. But the bargain sister had ended when she expected you to pay over 20 euro for stale leftover cake. Not the jerk. My girlfriend now regrets dumping me after years, so I laughed and told her to buzz off. So I have an ex-girlfriend who after years is now begging for me to take her back. We started dating in college and back then I was pretty awkward, but I did love her very much. I always went above and beyond for her as much as I could. Even as a broke college student, I would give her my last just to make her happy. I thought we would last forever, honestly. Well, long story short, she cheated on me and hooked up with an old friend of mine. The breakup messed me up pretty bad, so I put a pause on dating and I found peace investing my time into other things like my tech career, hobbies, and other things like that. Now, years later, she's begging me to get back together after she cheated on me. She ran into me one day. She said that she wanted to catch up and told me how she regretted it all and regrets how everything happened. I laughed at this and told her to buzz off. I said that I was not interested in catching up and that I had to go. Well, now she's blowing up my Instagram and Facebook, sending me paragraphs about how I laughed at her love for me. She says that she misses us. My buddies keep telling me that I should just take her back and start a family, like how I've wanted while I'm still in my early 30s since I'm getting older. But the way I see it is that at this point in my life, I'd rather be alone than to be in bad company. Don't get me wrong, I'd love to finally start a family of my own, but I don't want to do that with the wrong person. They think I'm a jerk for not forgiving her because the clock for me to have a family is ticking. Am I wrong? If your buddies truly cared about you, they would tell you to never be someone's consolation prize, especially if that someone cheated on you with someone who was supposed to be your friend. Honestly, publicly reply, Asking if she loved you so much, then why did she cheat on you? That will change things pretty quickly. The temptation of cheating in college for a rush of some kind is more than being a crappy person. It's a glimpse into more complex insecurity and mental issues. You can do better, you deserve better, and she knows it too. Not wrong. She's just experiencing the drastic difference in power dynamics she had in relationships during her 20s to what she now has in her 30s and trying to scramble back to her comfort zone. She doesn't love you and she never did. 
She just remembers a time where she could do whatever she wanted and guys would be willing to put up with it and wants to go back to that. Her childish rants on social media about being owed your love prove that. Entitled Mom Thinks My Pokemon Card Can Blind Her Kid Cast We've got Entitled Mom. We've got Nice Kid, who wasn't entitled at all. We've got Store Owner and me, Pokemon Card Collector. I was at a shopping arcade that specializes in nerdy stuff. Legos, Goku figures, Pokemon cards, etc. I was at a shop that sold Pokemon cards on the shelf. Not just booster packs, but loose cards like EXs, GXs, full arts, rainbow rares, etc. I took a card out from the shelf. It was a full art Cobalion GX, very rare, and went to the counter to pay. Then the entitled mom and nice kid came over to me, and this conversation happened. Entitled mom. Excuse me, but did you pay for this card? Me. Yes, ma'am. Yes, okay, whatever. But can I request that you don't show this card to my son? Me. Uh, what? I was not directly showing the card to your son. Entitled mom. No, I meant don't look at the card at all. You could possibly blind someone. Now, I was very confused by what she meant. Exactly what did she mean by blindness? Me. I'm sorry, could you explain why I shouldn't look at the card? When you look at the card, the light from the card bounced into my son's eyes and he almost got blinded. It's a safety hazard if you think about it. For your information, the cards on the shelf were under a really bright mini spotlight, so it looked really nice displaying them, and so extra light would bounce off to grab customers' attention. However, this happened when the card was already taken out of the bright shelf. Her son was not affected by the light whatsoever. Plus, Pokemon cards aren't that reflective and bright. Me. I'm sorry that you feel uncomfortable with the card. You don't have to buy it. Entitled Mom. Where's the store owner? Let me talk to him. He's over there by the counter. I point to the counter. Entitled Mom then walks over to the store owner. The owner is just saying how rude and annoying she was, and I hoped that store owner would handle things because he was pretty strict. After about a minute when I had to go pay, the owner came over to us with Entitled Mom. Owner. So, what's the problem, Entitled Mom? Entitled Mom. This card is going to cause someone to go blind in the store. My son almost got blinded by the light. Store owner. OP, what card is this? Me. It's the full art Cobalion GX. Entitled Mom. If it's the one where the person playing with it does not care about safety, then that's the card. Okay, now everyone in the whole store heard that and was in shock, especially the owner. Calling someone who does not care about safety is a total no-go, especially to a card collector slash player like me. Owner. Listen, lady. If you ever insult anyone here in this store again, I'm going to be talking about you to the arcade owner, and you will be banned from this store. Understood? Whatever. Let's go, nice kid. Nice kid. But I want to buy a card. Shut up. Let's go. Now that Entitled Mom is gone, we were able to buy the card in peace. I left the store with my precious Full Art Cobalion GX and went back to the MTR, what we call the subway or metro in Hong Kong, to a restaurant for dinner. I saw another post about someone thinking a symbol can blind someone, and now I have a similar experience to share with you. Moral. A Pokemon card will not blind you even if it's super shiny. Pokemon cards aren't even that shiny anyways. Speaking of Pokemon, what's your favorite Pokemon of all time? Please let me know. Dispatcher refuses to send van in for maintenance, gets forced to change my tire while I enjoy dinner on company time. This story is one of how a lowly delivery driver got to royally irk a dispatcher, waste his time, get four hours of overtime, meal paid for, and a free beer. So I was a driver for a little company that rhymes with Slamazon. I had been there for several months by this point and had developed a reputation of being very serious about vehicle maintenance. We aren't talking like washing them or whatnot, but cleaning out urine bottles, fixing broken wiper blades, installing lights to replace the burnt out ones, or other stuff that would indicate you actually remotely care for your driver's well-being. Seriously guys, I had a van once with no working lights of any kind and its passenger side door fell off its hinges right in front of my dispatchers and they still sent me out. Needless to say, some trips were better than others, but this particular time, well, it was a doozy. You see, friends, I was considered a problem driver by some for being obsessed with vehicles being kept road legal. I had not caused any issues other than this. We had dispatchers that were promoted up after a month, 
and after hitting mailboxes, cars, and other kinds of insanity, but I was always skipped over. This naturally irked me to no end, and I was looking for better within six months of starting. I was there for nearly two years. Naturally, all my requests for the essential equipment and urine bottle removal was denied. So I'd buy bulbs for my van and pull them out after my route was done so I could put them into the next one the next day, and I'd chuck the bottles out on the record. Kinda gross, but better than smelling it in the hot Georgia sun in the middle of summer in a van with sometimes working AC. This nonsense continued for the entirety of my time there, of course. This event, however, was the first of many times I decided to get back at the dispatchers for messing with my routes and giving me the worst vans and so on. You see, this van had the lights that were bad, broken AC, shook like crazy, squeaked, smelled gross, door didn't properly lock, so anybody could have stolen packages from it and not much could be done. And to top all of this off, four bad tires, like metal bands exposed and one bulging out. The whole day, I babied this van as best I could, putting air in the tire a few times and just barely finishing my route with some daylight to spare. So, 10 hours on the road down and an hour and a half back to the distribution center. I get underway and get about halfway before I felt the telltale shake of a tire going out. Well, here we go, I say to myself and scan my surroundings. I'm on the interstate and not very far from an off-ramp. So, with what little tire I have, I limp off the ramp and go to a parking lot which is right next to an Applebee's. Perfect luck, all things considered. I call dispatch and give my exact location and tell them what happened. The conversation goes as thus. We've got me, Chuck It Bucket 007, and we've got the dispatcher, the jerk. Me. Hey, I got a flat over here at my location. Dispatcher. What? How? Me. Because you sent me out in a van that needed tires. Dispatcher. Fine. Whatever. Everyone has gone home, so you're gonna have to wait till I get there. Me. Sure, that's fine. I'll stay clocked in then. Dispatcher. Uh-uh. You finished your route, so I don't see why you would be on the clock. Me. Because I am still in command of this vehicle, I have the keys, and if you want me to give it back, you are going to keep me on the clock. I had called the company HR and explained everything before I called Dispatcher, and they ensured me that my time would be recorded. Dispatcher. Fine. I have things to do tonight, so we gotta hurry up. Perfect. Time to mess with this guy. After giving him extremely vague directions while I enjoy a steak meal and a large beer on the clock and no hoots given anymore, he finally finds it. I go out there and see that he has brought the smallest, saddest, most not usable for the task Jack in the center. Me. Well, get to it. You made me leave with this van and you can change the tire. Dispatcher. Nuh-uh. You were driving it and I interject. Me. Drivers are not allowed by company policy to perform repairs to the van. He had yelled at me previously for doing this with the bulbs. Only dispatch, management, maintenance, and the repair shop can repair the van. So I walk away to finish my meal while he tries to fix this flat with a jack barely able to lift the front of the vehicle and needed bricks and other items to even go high enough. In total, I wasted four hours of his time, cost him time to smoke up, and he missed the game that he apparently had money on. I got my meal effectively for free with the hefty overtime I got that week. As an extra smackdown, corporate came in and fired the manager, assistant manager, and this particular dispatcher for failure to maintain the vehicles to DOT standards and for mismanaging the DSP, delivery service provider, after my lovely chat with HR during the incident. I showed them the text messages and some of the recorded audio I had taken of Dispatcher being a general jerk. A week later and we had a tent management comprised of corporate operations that would oversee the vans getting replaced with less crappy ones, training new management, and of course, giving training on what to do if you have a vehicle fail like that, and granting drivers some maintenance permissions. Entitled mom demands I give her spoiled kid my blanket during a drill. So fair warning, this did happen a bit ago but I wasn't permitted internet at the time this all went down. I was at a rehab facility for those with mental illness and or behavioral issues. I have really bad PTSD and depression and I was in a really dark place, which is why I was there. Our parents weren't allowed to stay here with us, but parents did come and visit occasionally. And today, a girl's mother was visiting her. This girl wasn't very well liked. 
She acted spoiled, entitled to everything, and would routinely insult other people. She's the entitled kid. I'll call her Martha. The whole group was glad to be away from Martha while she visited her mom in a separate area. I was one of the older kids. I was 16 while Martha was 15, and the other girl involved in the story, we'll call her May, was 14. May and I were particularly close. May shared a name similar to my younger sister and was the same age, so I saw her as a younger sibling figure and took care of her a lot. While she was 14, she acted a lot younger, so I kind of ended up caring for her, especially seeing as the staff could be quite neglectful of our emotional needs. On this particular night, I was laying down in my bed. It wasn't super late, it was only around 8.30, visiting hours for parents end at 9ish, but I happened to be pretty tired and was laying down half asleep. And then my ears were invaded with a blaring noise. Someone pulled the fire alarm, meaning we had to evacuate the whole huge building. This had happened twice before, so I was rather prepared. Kids happen to pull the fire alarm here a lot, looking to cause trouble or escape or whatever. It was pretty cold and rainy out, so I threw on my shoes and grabbed a blanket I had brought from home. I was sensitive to noise and got overwhelmed pretty easily, so evacuating a crowded building full of people and noise wasn't fun, especially considering how I had hit my head on the way out, so my head was already pounding. While all this was not very fun, neither was sitting out in the cold, damp atmosphere afterwards. A kid tried running away and another tried fighting a staff member, so I was naturally pretty on edge at the time, as were most of the other kids. Martha and her mom were talking about something or other. I tried to keep as much distance as I could between us without getting in trouble. Then May came up to me. She was barefoot on the pavement in her PJs. She hadn't managed to bring anything outside with her. I felt bad, so I opened up my blanket and let her in so she could stay warm. She didn't even have shoes, so this was the least I could do. I did my best to comfort her through everything that was happening. When, mid-conversation, Martha approached us and began tugging on my blanket. A moment passed and she looked at me and said, Can I come in? Now, considering that Martha was fully dressed, totally okay, called me fat on multiple occasions, and made fun of May's brother and made her cry, I decided to say, No, sorry, I can't fit anyone else. Martha continued to try and get in my blanket, but I had no obligation to her and it wasn't a particularly big blanket. It didn't even cover my mattress or reach my feet when draped over me, and I'm pretty short. After pestering me for a bit, Martha huffed and walked off, and I assumed it was over, until her mother came over, with her hanging back a few paces. Now, it's kind of super against the rules here to speak to any kids who aren't yours here, so I was surprised when this lady started talking to me. The staff were tied up with the runners and the fighters, but our conversation went something like this. The mom went up to my face and began speaking to me in a raised tone of voice. Again, I'm noise sensitive, so not fun. Her. Let my daughter use your blanket. Me. I'm sorry, but no. Nobody else can fit, and the other girl here doesn't have shoes. Her. But my daughter is so cold. I think she needs it more than you two do. Keep in mind that this blanket is mine, something I brought from home to this place. Me. I'm sorry miss, but it's mine. I can't give my blanket to your daughter. This lady is now holding the hem of my blanket like she's about to yank it from us and is full on yelling at us. May and I are flinching. She's scared and I'm really bad with yelling. Her. You can't hog this blanket all to yourselves. If you can't share, then you should give Martha the blanket. At this point, her yelling attracted a few staff members who weren't caught up with all the behavioral kids who told her that she wasn't allowed to talk to us. She kept complaining about how unfair it was that I had a blanket and her poor dear daughter had to freeze. I spent the rest of the drill comforting May, who was crying because she had been yelled at. Entitled mom parks in front of my house and fails to realize her own hypocrisy. I'll try to make the backstory quick, but there's a few things you should know before I get to the story. My neighborhood is all street parking with no lines or signage. You can park anywhere but there are some unwritten rules that us neighbors tend to follow to keep the chaos at a minimum. I'll explain further down. I actually posted in this sub about this same woman in my neighborhood previously. If you go to my post history, she's the woman who yelled at my now husband for parking in front of our home, giving such reasons as, nobody knows you, you're new, we weren't, and I have a baby. Anyway, time passed and we became friendly-ish, 
Like I would wave and smile if I saw her because, you know, don't crap where you eat. Anyway, since that last story, I have become a mom. There is a very coveted parking space on the corner in front of our house that my nice neighbor usually left her car parked in eternally. She never moved it, but after my son was born, she ended up needing to sell that car that she never drove and told me to park on the corner as much as I like. I was extremely grateful for this. Everyone else in the neighborhood respected this as well. Not because they had to, but because they were very kind to us. After a few months of parking bliss, Entitled Mom decided to take advantage of the situation. She lives with her now 10-year-old son in the house directly across the street from me. The one unwritten rule I mentioned before that all my neighbors respect is that we don't park on the sides of the street opposite our homes. Our street is all townhomes and houses are in close quarters with multiple drivers per unit. If there isn't parking on the main street, then we usually use the side streets. Now, because this rule isn't a law, I wasn't too mad at this entitled mom for parking in the corner spot that my neighbor and I were sharing. She can legally park wherever she likes, but day after day of this happening and having to lug groceries and my heavy baby carrier down the street back and forth, I started getting exasperated. She was also making my neighbor on my other side upset because she wouldn't pull all the way up to the corner and he wouldn't be able to fit his truck in the spot behind her. Things started escalating when I found out that my nice neighbor was really mad at this entitled mom and I think may have confronted her about it possibly on my behalf. I was trying not to stoop down to entitled mom's level by getting mad or yelling about it, but things escalated even further when I heard her yelling outside my window. It was hot out, my car was parked in the corner spot, and I was sitting in my bedroom at my desk by my open window when I heard, This jerk keeps parking in my spot! I looked up and saw her walking from the side street on my side of the street and chatting with another woman about it very casually. I was so shocked. I actually laughed because I had suspected she was parking there not out of a lack of spots in her side of the street, but specifically because she wanted that exact spot. And I was right. My husband told me I was crazy. I couldn't wait to tell him about it when he got home from work and we had a good laugh about it. The final event so far that encouraged me to make this post happened several months later. We've been playing this game of who gets the spot all winter and now my son is 9 months teething and generally giving me a pretty hard time most days so I will admit I'm not in the best mindset at the end of the day. My husband calls and tells me he's on his way home with groceries. I went out and moved my car so that he could park his car there and we could all quickly unload the groceries together. I swear by the time I walked back up to my house this entitled mom had slid right into the space I had made. Again, I know I can't be mad because you can park anywhere you want legally, but at this time of day, I had absolutely had it, so I confronted her nicely. I know her name, so assume when I say Entitled Mom that I'm saying her name. I said, Excuse me, Entitled Mom. Hi, how are you? Entitled Mom. Hi, good. And she keeps walking away. I'm guessing she either didn't want to talk or thought I was just being nice and saying hi. Me. Hey, would you mind moving your car? I actually just moved my car out of that space so that my husband could park there and we could unload our groceries. Entitled Mom. That doesn't make it your spot. Me. No, you're right, it doesn't. I'm just asking for a favor so that we don't have to haul our groceries several blocks from our house. Entitled Mom. The spot was open and I took it. Me. Yes, I know, but I'm asking nicely if you would please allow my husband to park here this time. Entitled Mom. She points across the street to a spot that is open almost directly in front of her own house and says, There's a spot right there! Me. I never park on the other side of the street. Why don't you park there? I think she caught on to what I was saying, but not saying. So then she comes at me with the excuses again just like 8 years ago. Listen, I have a child and oh yeah, I have a 9 month old. So I totally understand why it's so helpful to be able to park close to your house. She just stared at me for a few seconds looking annoyed. I was hoping my face looked calm and neutral, but who knows, I'm awkward as heck. She didn't say anything else after that, she just left. Entitled Mom demands I give her precious angel my laptop. So for those of you who don't know, I travel a lot because of business. My second to last flight I had is the one I'll be talking about. Four months ago, I was on a Delta Airlines flight from JFK Airport, New York to LAX, California. A few minutes after we took off, a boy started running down the aisle beside my seat. He looked like he was about 5 or 6, so it didn't matter to me much. 
except for the fact that I was wondering where his parents were. He kept going on for about 10 minutes until a flight attendant told him to sit down. It revealed that his seat was directly behind me, which kind of sucked because I didn't know if he was going to have a tantrum in the middle of the flight. After we reached our cruising altitude, I decided to pull out my laptop and watch some Netflix as I couldn't do much more than fiddle with the settings. This was around the time that Boyce started running down the aisle again. When he reached the front of the plane and began running towards his seat, he stopped and looked at my laptop. The following conversation ensued. Boy. Whoa, is that an iPad? Me. No, buddy. It's a laptop. It's a mini computer. Do you have any games on it? No, I use it for work when I'm traveling. Then what's that? He started pointing at my screen. It's a movie. Since I can't do any work right now, I started watching this. But if you're not using it, why can't I use it? Buddy, the answer is no. I can't trust you with it because I don't know if you'll damage it or not. Okay, fine. He seemed to understand, so he walked back to his seat. I put on my headphones and unpaused the movie. About two minutes later, I feel a tap on my shoulder and the crap storm began. Entitled Mom. Excuse me? Why did you tell my son he can't use your laptop? Me. Because I don't know if he'll damage it or not. Plus, I just got it. Oh, come on. He won't do anything. He's been good for the entire flight. Then why has he been running down the aisle? He just wanted to get some energy out. It's a long flight, you know. Can't you just give him the laptop for 10 minutes so he can play some games? Me. Ma'am, I don't have any games on here. I just use it for work. All I have is Netflix and Roblox. For those of you wondering why I would have Roblox, I downloaded it before a previous flight I was on with my nephew so he could play some games while we waited at the gate. Entitled Mom. I knew you had games on it. Just give it to me so he can play some games. She started reaching for the laptop. I slapped her arm away. For the last time, your spawn can't use my laptop. I've explained it more than once. Your son is not having my laptop. I did not give you permission to use it. The answer is no, and that's final. By the time I got that out of my mouth, a flight attendant noticed what was happening and came over. Flight attendant, what's going on here? Me. She, he stole my laptop and tried to hurt me. Kick him off the flight, now. Me. First off, that's not true. Your son asked me if he could use it and I said no. So he complained about it to you and here we are now. Second, you tried to grab my laptop, so I slapped your arm away. Third, I turned the laptop off, then on. If it's your laptop, unlock it. Entitled Mom fiddled with random letters until I got locked out, temporarily. I then turned it around, put in the right password, and boom, it was back to the desktop screen. Flight attendant, ma'am, sit down immediately. If you hesitate or do anything else to escalate this situation, we will have authorities waiting for you at the gate. Do you understand? Entitled Mom looked down as if defeated. Y yes. I put my laptop away and waited for the plane to land. When we landed, I grabbed my luggage and got off the flight as fast as I could. I didn't see Entitled Mom or the boy anywhere, so I assumed the police were waiting for them when they got off. Speaking of Roblox, have you ever played that game? Do you like it or not really? Please let me know. Poor assistant manager just trying to do her job, but won't let me do mine. Backstory. I'm an electrical engineer for a steel company. The owner who I work for has a sister and brother-in-law that own multiple McDonald's. Knowing that I also do the IT at my company, my owner one year, around 2006 or 2007, came to me with a problem his sister was having in her home office where she ran her business. No problem, side work. I go to her house and clean everything up, get her stuff back up and running, and continue to do that each month because she is really clicky and tends to mess stuff up bad due to impatience. Fast forward to 2008 and the recession hits. I'm over there one day and casually mention that my wife was looking for daytime work now that our youngest son is in school. She is promptly hired. A month later and they decided to move the office to a real office instead of her luxurious, really it was, basement. There was nothing in this office at all. It used to be a plumber shop. I'm promptly hired to put on a retainer to get the office up and running. New computers, new printers, server, all wiring, remote access, all the bells and whistles. It took a month. Fast forward about 10 years later and my wife is now the office manager. I'm still on a monthly retainer for all IT work needed. I've also over those 10 years helped in some stores when new things pop up, 
like adding things to the network to be able to use our local university's college kids' stipend cards, etc. All the store managers know me, all the regional managers know me, the director knows me, and of course, the owners know me. Heck, we all go out once a year on a bus trip to Cleveland or someplace and party together. Now, the night in question, my wife and I had just gotten done having a few drinks after work and we were making our way back to our house about six blocks away when I decided to go get a dinner box from one of our McDonald's for us and our two sons still living with us. Two Big Macs, two regular cheeseburgers, 10-piece chicken McNuggets, and four small fries. I pull into the drive-thru and place the order. The young lady instantly comes back and says they are not accepting credit cards currently and can only accept cash. I'm confused for a second because cashless, as they call it, only goes down briefly around 2 a.m. for some audit or something, my wife says. It's 9 p.m. I have cash on me, so it isn't an issue. I get to the window and pay and ask about cashless being down to the girl, whom me or my wife don't know. McDonald's turnover rate. You get it. She briefly mentions something about one of the readers being knocked over, so I just say, okay, I'll be right in. She looks at me a little curious, but says nothing. I park in, walk in the side door with my wife to try and sort out what's going on when the young lady says that I'm not permitted behind the counter. I get it, you don't know me or my wife, so I ask her to get her shift manager real fast. She does, and just my bad luck, it's an assistant manager that had just recently been promoted and I don't know her either, nor does my wife. I try to explain that I work IT for the office, which she can see if you look over my right shoulder out the window and that I was going to look and see what was going on with the cash list to try to get it back up. I introduce my wife by name and mention that she's the office manager at the main office, and I point and can vouch for me. She still isn't letting me behind the counter. I'm not angry or upset about this, as she really is just doing her job, and nicely as well. I nod understandingly and pull out my phone. I swipe through my contacts and stop at the store manager and bring it up and show her asking if we should call her by name. I swipe through my contacts again to the regional manager and do the same thing, showing her my phone and calling her by name. I then do the same thing with the director of operations and then both owners. I finally just said, pick one. I know cashless is the main payment method and every moment it's down costs quite a bit. The light bulb went off and she nodded. My wife, the beautiful social butterfly she is, strikes up a conversation with the newly promoted assistant manager and starts talking shop as I head to the drive through to begin diagnosing things. Someone had accidentally knocked over one of the card readers and they aren't small. A quick inspection revealed that the port had somehow got multiple of the contacts bent. Some were shorting together. I'm assuming the ones that were shorting were causing the main hub of it to flip out, so I set about trying to bend the pins back into shape somewhat. I plug everything back in, reboot it, and voila. Cashless is back in five minutes. The assistant manager thanks me and I just say to leave a little note that I was here and what I did. My wife says she'll also mention it in the office to the regional managers. I got an atta boy from the owners for that one and a free chocolate shake. Entitled mom demands bride be less happy on her wedding day. So let me preface this saying this is my mom's story, not mine. I don't know all the details because I know it's a painful memory and I don't want to make her relive it. The characters will be my mom, entitled mom, entitled sister, and my dad. My mom is the youngest of two girls. She and my dad went to high school together but didn't start dating until they were both in college. It was a chance meeting that they ran into each other in a bar. Cute story. Still happily married and in love 23 years later. It all started when my mom got engaged. My aunt was so upset because she wasn't engaged first, even though she was older. Throughout all the planning, she was pouting and kind of cold towards my mom. So the day of the wedding comes. My mom is getting ready with her bridesmaids. She is marrying the guy she has had a crush on since high school. She has her perfect venue and she's wearing her grandmother's, my great grandmother's dress. Everything is going absolutely perfect until my aunt starts crying. My mom tried to comfort her because she is the most selfless woman in the world. Even though she was getting married in mere hours, she was focused on her sister. A little while later, after my aunt ran off, my grandmother pulled my mom aside. Like I said, I don't know every detail, but the conversation went something like this. Entitled Mom Hey, you're really making Entitled Sister upset. My mom, confused. What did I do? You're way too happy and it's making her upset that she didn't get married before you. 
My mom. Pardon me? Entitled mom. Can you just be a little less happy? My mom was in shock. This was supposed to be the happiest day of her life, and here was her mother telling her to be less happy, so her sister didn't get upset. My mom's whole life, she was always told to set her accomplishments aside so her sister felt special too. When she was younger, she was told by her parents she would never go to college because she had a hard time in school, dyslexia and ADD before professional help was available. My mom defied all odds and graduated with a master's degree. Can you guess who got all the glory for graduating from college? You guessed it, my aunt. And on this day, my mom wasn't having it. My mom. Look mom, I'm sorry that entitled sister is upset, but today is about me and the groom. We're happy and I'm not going to hide that or pretend I'm not just so entitled sister won't be sad. Today is the happiest day of my life and I'm not giving that up for anyone. My grandmother shut up after that. She did give my mother a disapproving look though. I don't even need to have been there to see it. My mom still gets them all the time. After that, the wedding was perfect. My mother still talks about it with stars in her eyes. Now, my mother still has to deal with their crap sometimes, but she also has told my dad and us kids, two of us are adults now, to help stand up for her. She's very happy and I'm so glad she stood up for herself. There are a few stories like this that I know about, but this one makes me the saddest. I'm just glad she didn't let it ruin her wedding day. I told my mom about all the support she got in this post and how many uploads it has, and she got so happy, joking that she was Reddit famous and was so overjoyed that everyone was so kind. Would you ever act less happy if someone asked you to? Please let me know. Entitled mom thinks if my garage door is open, she and her bratty son can search for and take what they want. I've been lurking here and have been afraid to post because I'm awkward and don't know if my stories will be as well liked as everyone else's. So here goes. I am posting from my phone so it might be some mistakes. The stars. We've got myself from about 16 years ago. I'm 28 so I was 14 at the time. We've got entitled mom. My neighbor from across the street. A self-entitled mother. We've got B5K. Her five-year-old kid who's obsessed with other people's stuff. The scene, my garage. During the summer between 7th and 8th grade, my parents would go to work and leave me with a giant list of chores so overwhelming I wouldn't even try. Also, I live in Texas, so it would sometimes be too hot to try. One day, to avoid being crapped on, I decided I would attempt to do the chore, clean out the garage. My parents hoard crap and they get upset when they can't find what they want and my stepfather just buys crap and doesn't even try to put it somewhere. So it's my job to organize the garage so that my mom can actually park her car. I'm moving stuff around for a few hours and I'm sweaty and hot and all it looked like I was really doing anyway was just removing the mess. I came across my tricycle from when I was younger. I put it outside on the driveway so I can try to find a place for it later. I decide to take a break and go inside fix some lunch. A couple minutes later, I hear rummaging in the garage and something break. I thought it was my cat. I look. It was B5K. Sounds like a Star Wars droid name. Searching through the place. Looking around like he just found good treasure. Me. Hey, B5K. Where's your brother? He's grounded till Monday. Me. Well, you should go home and play with him. What did you break? Kid looks like he's gonna cry. Me. Listen, I don't play unless your brother is there too. Please go home. So I close the door. I thought that was the end of it. I go back to my food and VH1 music videos. When I'm done, I go back outside and I notice something is missing. The tricycle is gone. I knew who took it, B5K. So I get on my bike and ride it around the block. I catch up to B5K in almost no time at all. He tried to start pedaling faster, but it's a tricycle, so it's not like you can do that. I want everyone to know this. This was no plastic thing that leans back. This was made out of metal and looked almost like a very small bike. So anyway, I yell at the kid to stop. He starts crying and ignores me. I pedal up to him and get in front of him. He rides into my bike and falls. I don't help him up, but I take my trike back. I put it inside the house and then go back outside to finish up in my garage. Now from across the street to the left, I hear B5K yelling to someone. I assumed it was his older sister. She was a year behind me and didn't usually care about the stuff he complained about. So I expected her to come over here 
and just give me a little crap playfully and then go home. I go back to my chore and then I feel someone prod me between my shoulder blades. I assume this to be his sister, so I turn around, ready for a pretty smile and a sarcastic chewing out. I was ill prepared for this because it was Entitled Mom in all her rage. Entitled Mom, what did you steal from my son? Me, nothing. My son says you took something from him while he was playing. Where is it? Me, I didn't give him a thing. He tried to steal my tricycle. Where is it? Not telling you. You could have heard him. Me, I look at her very confused. He was only playing. Give him his tricycle back. His tricycle? He got it from my garage. Well, you're too old for it. Me, look lady, I'm just trying to finish a job so that I don't have to worry about it. Please walk away. I pull my flip phone out of my pocket and called my mom. Entitled mom promised to have my trike back when my mother came home and picked up her little thief and left. Did you ever have a tricycle of your own? Or how about rollerblades, skateboards, or a scooter? Please let me know. My uncle's entitled ex-girlfriend ruined the day I was born. My parents have told this story numerous times and I have relayed it on occasion to anyone who found it interesting. Although in this case, the person of interest isn't an entitled parent per se, she wasn't at the time, but who's to say so now over 20 years later? I believe it still fits for this subreddit. By the time I was born, my parents were already familiar with the birthing process as they had had quite a few kids before me. My mother knew how she wanted to do it and who she wanted to be there for it. At this point, it was practically routine. My father's brother is a great guy, but kind of a pushover in romantic relationships. He had been dating around for quite some time, but none of his previous girlfriends had ended up being marriage potential. Unfortunately, neither was this one. At the time of my birth, nobody had really met his girlfriend. They had heard of her, seen her maybe once or twice, but the relationship hadn't been cemented yet. It was late on a Wednesday evening when my mother awoke my dad and announced that the baby was on the way. They quickly packed up their things, calling nearby family members to let them know they were on their way to the hospital. My grandparents arrived around the same time as them, as well as a couple of my husband's brothers. By this time, my mom had been in labor for several hours and was just about to enter active labor. She determined that only she and my father would be in the room for the birthing process. That's when Entitled Girlfriend spoke up as my mother was being taken into the room. Entitled Girlfriend What about me? My dad What about you? Aren't you going to invite me in the room too? My grandmother I don't think that's entirely appropriate. Oh, come on. I'm a woman, so I know what it's going to be like in there. I can handle the screaming and everything. My subservient uncle. That's not the point, Entitled Girlfriend. What are you talking about? I'm about to be family too. I have every right to be in there. Dad. It's not your decision to make. Uncle. I'm sorry, but... Entitled Girlfriend, whining. Baby, you know it's my birthday. She wasn't lying. It actually happened to be her birthday. This baby's being born on the same day as my birthday. It just proves I'm meant to be in there. It's like a birthday gift for me. Dad, I'm sorry. What? Entitled girlfriend. If I'm not in the room for the birth, then how are they going to name the baby after me? Dad looks at uncle, who appears to be just as surprised at her question. What the heck? Grandma. They are not naming the baby after you. We're here to be supportive, and you're making a scene. It's not fair. Dad walks into the room with my mom. Honey, you would not believe what I just heard. Uncle's crazy girlfriend thinks we're naming our baby after her. My mom. Why does she think that? Dad laughs. Apparently it's her birthday. Mom pauses. What time is it? Almost 11 p.m. Why? My mom. No way in heck I'm delivering this baby until midnight. And she held true to her words. She didn't start pushing until my dad confirmed it was midnight. Entitled girlfriend complained the whole time about how it was taking so long and she wanted to hold the baby, but she ended up leaving before the baby was officially delivered. Major kudos to my mom who managed to remain calm during the birth and have me when she was good and ready. Entitled mom thinks I'm not old enough to see Jumanji too. I'm 14, but I've been told since I was 13 that I'm short for my age and have a bit of a baby face, and I'm cool with that. A lot of people are nice when they find out my actual age, but it upsets me when people are just stuck-up jerks about it, 
So here's one of those times. Bit of backstory. My mom's friend is a manager at a local Regal Cinemas downtown, and they've known each other since high school, and they're the best of friends. It's important to the story to know that he was at my 13th and 14th birthday. Anyways, on to the story. Cast. We've got me. We've got manager buddy. We've got entitled mom slash ticket receptionist. So about a week after Jumanji 2 came out, and I wanted to see it for the first time, it was Saturday. I asked my parents if they could take me. My dad said he couldn't because he was called for an emergency meeting at work, and my mom said she wasn't feeling well. My mom gave me $25 to go by myself, so I took an Uber and got to the theater 15 minutes before the movie. I went inside and pulled out a $10 bill, and this is how the following conversation went. Me. One ticket to Jumanji, please. The entitled mom, early 30s, stared me up and down from face to foot. Entitled mom. I'm sorry, are your parents here? Me, a bit confused. No, why? Isn't it obvious, kiddo? You need to be 13 and up to see this movie. Note that I was 14 during all this crap. Me, chuckling. Oh, I'm sorry, this happens a lot. I'm 14. Entitled mom, now getting upset. Don't lie to me, young man. You're clearly 10. Please leave. I'd never let my kids watch this movie. Me, also getting upset. No, I'm 14. I get it, I look young for my age, but I'm not lying. You need to leave before I call the cops. You are trespassing. I literally dare you to. Entitled mom actually called the cops. Entitled mom looking smug. There, I called them, you little jerk. At this time, manager buddy came out of his office and walked up to us and stood next to me. Manager buddy. What's going on here? A woman came to me and told me there was some conflict out here. Entitled mom with a dramatic voice. This kid lied to me about being 14. Manager buddy looked to me and this is what happened. OP, it's great to see you again. Can you tell me what's going on? Me, sure. I tell him everything, including what she called me. And when I was done, he looked at Entitled Mom with the most intimidating death glare I've ever seen. Entitled Mom, is this true? Entitled Mom, now looking nervous. Y yes You do realize what age he is, right? Ten. No, he's 14. I was at his birthday. Entitled Mom is silent. What other crap did you do? I, I called the police. You called the police on him? I thought he was ten. He, he wouldn't leave when I told him to. Entitled Mom, we've talked about this twice. You don't call the cops on kids. You call me first and tell me to come down to sort this out. Entitled Mom is silent. Manager Buddy with a calm voice. OP, go see your movie. It's on me. Me. Okay, thanks. The movie was great. I've always loved Kevin Hart. Anyways, after the movie, I went to Manager Buddy and here's what happened. Hey OP, don't worry, the cops were called off. An Entitled Mom was arrested for harassment and disturbing the peace. Did you like the movie? Me. Heck yeah, but one question. Does Entitled Mom actually have kids? Yeah, unfortunately. Manager Buddy and I both laughed hard at that. Entitled Mom didn't get prison or jail time, but she got three months of therapy two times a week and 100 hours of community service. Clarence Karen, a special breed. In college, I was working at a bookstore. The company was Christian owned and they made a pretty big deal about it and all their merch was geared towards that clientele. So one fall, they were having a huge sale. A lot had been moved to Clarence in our store and several bonus coupons were in that month's mail out. This woman, entitled woman, came in with her husband. They had filled, I kid you not, 12 handheld baskets with junk, and I mean junk. A lot of it was clearanced because it was damaged or broken in some minor way. I patiently rang them all up, secretly excited how the sale would look on my numbers for the week. I made small talk about the weather and her items. Oh, this candle smells nice, like usual, and I thought all was going great. At the end of the purchase, I asked if she had any coupons. She handed me a 20% off her entire purchase and I scanned it. It brought the total down from over $500 to about $450 because it only applied to the non-clearance items as explained in bold letters below the big 20% text entitled lady. That coupon is for 20% off. You didn't take 20% off. Me. The coupon can only take 20% off the regularly priced items, ma'am. I hurried to scroll back through the running list on my screen. It looks like it took 20% off all of the non-clearance items. 
entitled Lady Huffs and Digs in her bag, producing the sale ad and handing me several more coupons. One was able to take an additional 10% off a book. It was book specific and another took a few dollars off, but her total was still well over $400. Another coupon was a buy one get one free. Buy two clearance items under $5, get the third free. I looked back over her purchase and saw she had about 30 $5 or less candles and other smaller items like bookmarks, highlighters, etc. Me. I can scan this coupon, but it'll only save you about $5. If you'd like, I can take off most of the items that are under $5. But I want to buy them all. Me. I understand that. Let me explain. I know how coupons work. You don't need to get snotty with me. I sighed and scanned the coupon. Why did that only take off $5? I bought more than three items, young lady. I plastered on my teacher face and smiled. Me. As I was trying to explain, it's only good for a total of three items per transaction. If you'd like, I can remove the other items from this transaction and then scan the rest up separately. That way you're still getting the same amount for free. I should probably mention that doing so was way against company policy, but as my assistant manager was always saying, we don't get paid enough to care when people are mad over $5. Just make it work. Entitled Lady So why won't it work on this transaction? Scan it again! You must not have done it right. Me I can scan it again, but I can see that it won't work no matter how many times I scan it. The coupons that work and the items they apply to turn green. And if it doesn't work, a big error message comes up and it'll say in red that it doesn't apply with a brief explanation of why. The system is saying it won't work because it has already been applied to qualifying items. Lose the attitude. I don't deserve this. I'm spending hundreds of dollars in here. Fix it. At this point, I wanted to throw my computer screen at her, but I know manager definitely gets paid enough to care about that. Instead, I plastered on another smile. Me. I'll scan the coupon again, and if you'd like to step to the side here, I'll show you my screen so you can see that it doesn't work that way no matter how many times I scan it. I'm not going to do your job for you. Make it work. I scanned the coupon again, and surprise, it didn't work. Me. As I've said, it's not going to work this way. Again, I'm more than happy to remove the items from your purchase and ring them out as separate transactions, but I can't make the computer accept the coupon. Well, that's not what I want. I want to buy these items, so I wouldn't have picked them out, would I? Now I'm just done. Me. I found that's why customers generally select items, yes. She blinks at me and I am now smiling with true joy. I've managed to silence her for a moment. Me. If you'd like, I can go get my manager and see if he knows anything I don't. I know he doesn't, but I figure I can offer anyway and pass the buck to him. Entitled Lady. You should have offered that sooner. Go! As I'm walking to the other side of the checkout kiosk, I hear her say to husband, Hopefully manager is more competent than this jerk. I go up to the manager and he leans in and I start to explain, but he tells me he's been listening to the whole thing and I'm right. Don't worry. We were pretty close friends outside of work and he knew I didn't mind confrontation at all, but he was in law school, so I knew Entitled Lady had it coming in some way. I handed manager the coupon and hung back while I labeled new merch. Manager tells the Entitled Lady, What seems to be the problem, ma'am? Entitled Lady is now in full-on Karen mode. That cashier is inept, and because of her, I won't be buying anything. She should be fired. I expect better service from a Christian store. Manager, I'm sorry to hear you aren't satisfied with our procedures. May I? Entitled Lady cuts him off and Rage explains what's happened, surprisingly accurately, and Manager nods along sympathetically. Entitled Lady, And your employee said you might be able to get the coupon to work. So I expect you to. I did the math, and this shouldn't be more than $200, so I won't be paying more than that. I trust that you can see to it that I get what I want. That's your job. Manager. I will certainly do everything I can. Manager scans the coupon, and once again, it's rejected. Let me call her over here. He waves me over and asks, Which way were you scanning the coupon? Instinctively, I swiped my hand in front of the scanner like I was holding a coupon. Left to right. Manager. Well, that's exactly what you're supposed to do. Now I can tell he's messing with her. Let me try it this way. He scans it right to left. Nope, still won't work. Let me see. Meanwhile, Entitled Lady has this smug grin like I'm about to be taught a lesson. Manager inputs the code manually and turns the screen all the way around, showing her the error. Manager. If you'll see here, 
This coupon has already been applied to as much merchandise as corporate allows. So, Entitled Lady then turns and storms out of the store. This store is pathetic. I won't ever be back. If a customer wants to use a coupon, you should let them. Husband follows her to the car, agreeing with her. When the door closes, manager turns to me and we're both nervous relief laughing, grateful the store is otherwise empty. Manager sent me to lunch, saying we'd reshelf her stuff in a bit. Halfway through my break, he comes in the back room. Manager, guess who just came back? Apparently, entitled lady sent husband in to buy everything full price, no coupon for anything. I worked at this store for another year and she did the same thing about six months later. I saw her coming toward my register at the same time manager did, caught his eye and went, nope, yours, and ducked under the counter to run to the back of the store. Manager wasn't happy with me, but after we both had left that day, he said, I couldn't say this on the clock, but I was only mad about earlier because you ran before I could. Best manager ever. Karen pays 90 euros for 300 euros of groceries at self-checkout. Before we start, just a heads up, this is the story of my brother. So this happened yesterday, March 20th, and my brother was working. It was around 7 p.m. And there was this entitled lady who had her cart just fully loaded with a lot of stuff. Nothing wrong with it. But at the self-checkout, she scanned a few items and she left 90 euros, I believe. This was seen on cameras and they called in my brother and his coworker to stop her while security was on their way. My brother and his coworker were near her. My brother and his coworker went to the exit to stop her and the conversation goes like this. My brother, can you please stop here? Is it correct that you didn't pay for these items? She obviously denied. His coworker, we saw it on the cameras. Lying doesn't get you any further. Entitled woman, I'm not lying. My brother, security is coming, so please wait here. Entitled lady, it's unfair. All those people with loads of groceries and me nothing, you arrest me? Coworker. Yeah, but they paid for it. Now the woman made fists and pushed her cart away and said, This is unfair, and was ready to give my coworker and my brother a punch and was willing to fight and was about to, but before that happened, the security came and took her down and she was now on the ground, not unconscious or anything. She then got taken away by the cops and my brother and his coworker left to go work again and that was about it. This isn't a dog daycare. A while back, I was working in an office that allowed dogs. It was an open floor plan, and since customers never came into the office, we kept the dog food and water bowls right by the front door just because it was the most convenient space and no one else would see them but us who worked there. Of the six of us who worked in the main office area, I was the only one who didn't have a dog, no pets policy at the apartment, and always felt horribly left out. To make matters worse, across the way was a doggy daycare. One day, a very frantic woman came in and she had an absolutely massive dog with her. Usually, the only people who came into the office were associates who had appointments with someone working there, but it was rare they brought their dogs. She ran up to me and said, Do you work here? And I said, Yes, how can I help you? And she said, I wasn't sure if you took walk-ins, but I read online I could just drop him off. I tried to call, but no answer. I didn't know what she was talking about at that point, and I said, come again? Who did you call exactly? Thinking if I could just saddle her off to whoever she came to see, I wouldn't have to decipher her problem. She said, well, it doesn't matter now. Look, something urgent's come up, and I really need to leave him here. Here's his food he likes, and I'll be back in a few hours, and... At this point, I wasn't thinking of the doggy daycare. I thought maybe she was a friend of someone here. I said, well, all right. Can I get your name, please? And she said her name and then asked if I needed her to sign anything. And I was so confused at this point, I just said, why would I need you to sign something? And she left almost immediately. So I took Otis, the dog, to the back and showed him to my coworkers and no one knew the woman or dog. I was worried she wouldn't come back. But at the same time, my wish for an office dog had been granted and Otis was supremely chill. All he did all day was lie around and drool onto his own ears. I just freshened him up every now and then, took him out every couple hours, and he was happy as a clam on a big cushy dog bed we thankfully had an extra of. He just loved attention from anywhere he could get it. At the end of the day, the woman, thank God, came back. She said, thanks, you're a lifesaver. How was he? And I said, he was a champ, and was about to say, but why is he here? 
When she said, That's a relief. Most kennels say he gets anxious around other dogs. I heard you operated at a much higher capacity. I was thrilled to see you had so few clients in the room at one time. So, how much do I owe you? And that's when I realized she thought we were a dog daycare. Now, I probably should have corrected her, but I loved my day with the office dog, and I did want to get paid for supervising this strange dog all day. I just threw out the number that sounded fair and appropriate. That'll be $20, I said. She replied, Really? In this very high tone, and I couldn't tell if I had overshot or undershot, but she paid me and left. My coworkers were laughing hysterically when they realized what had happened, and we thought it would just be a good story for the future. But the next week, she came back. She said we were so much more affordable and less overcrowded than her other place that she was happy to use us. I was glad for the company, so I just took him. I didn't think there was any way she couldn't have at least some idea we weren't a dog daycare. The whole ordeal was so strange, I just figured, don't question a good thing. I was much younger and dumber then. Not long after, Otis started getting dropped off two, sometimes even three or four days a week. I was in heaven. He was such a love, and he made fast friends with the delivery guys and visitors. One day, we took our office Christmas card photo, and Otis was over that day, so we included him in a Santa hat. It was pretty great, but it turns out Otis' owner was friends with one of our clients, who I guess happened to have the card out on her table or was kind enough to display it alongside her other holiday cards. Because one day, Otis' owner came in holding the card and walked up to me and said, I can't even believe I'm asking this, but is that my dog in this photo? This isn't a dog daycare at all. This is just an office, isn't it? She said it with a note of surprise, as though she was looking around and putting it all together for the first time. No coincidence that this was the first time she wasn't in some crazy rush either. She was like, Then who are all these other dogs? And I explained. I was terrified she was going to demand her money back, or worse, take some sort of legal action against us for misrepresenting ourselves as a dog care business or complain to corporate. Instead, she basically said, Why didn't you ever say anything? And I explained we just really liked having Otis around. She stopped for a minute and seemed to be thinking and said, Is that right? And I said yes and told her the story of how I was the only one in the office without a dog so loved the company. She seemed a little flummoxed or hesitant, understandably, because the whole ordeal was so weird. She turned to my coworker and asked if I was telling the whole truth. I don't know why she thought my coworker, also a stranger to her, was any more trustworthy than me. But hey, strange times. Coworker backed me up. So she said, I wish you'd said something sooner. Could have saved me a lot of embarrassment with my friend back there. All right, I have to get going. See you at four. And she left Otis. I couldn't believe it. I said, so he can stay? And she replied, where else could I find someone to watch him one-on-one -on -one all day for $20? And off she went. Otis stayed my office dog until his family moved away. Luckily, right around the same time, I took a new job. Speaking of dogs, what's your favorite dog breed of all time? Please let me know. Stop sending your kid over. I am not a babysitter. At first, I wasn't sure if this was an entitled parent story, because I think this woman is just plain crazy. But after reading a few of these, I have figured out that crazy and entitled are one and the same. Years ago, this new neighbor of mine, she had recently moved to a house on the next street over, kept trying for the better part of a summer to use me as a free babysitter. It started when her kid, who was a really well-behaved kid and about seven, showed up at my door at 7.15 in the morning. We were all just waking up and getting around, so I told him that my boys weren't ready to play yet and to come back in a few hours. That is when the kid told me his mom had gone to work. This seemed a bit odd to me, so I brought him in and tried to call his mom. This was the time of only landlines. Sure enough, she was gone. So I brought him in and fed him breakfast. He stayed with us the rest of the day and he got along well with my two boys, who were 5 and 10. I had only talked to his mom about two times, so I had no idea why she would think this was a good idea. When his mom came home, I walked him over so I could talk to her. I told her not to do that again. I told her that I would be willing to watch him on occasion if asked first, but not every day. Her response was, Well, what else do you have to do all day? This kind of took me by surprise. I tried to tell her that I work at home on commissions. 
She rolled her eyes and told me that being an artist isn't a real job. And besides, I was married, so I didn't need to work. I should have pointed out to her that she was married and working, but I felt myself getting angry and I didn't want to argue with her. Just don't do that again, I said to her. You have teenage kids home for the summer. Have them babysit. She frowned at me and said, They work. I said, So do I. Then I went home. The next morning at 7.15, the kid sheepishly shows up again. Once again, I bring him in and feed him breakfast and later lunch. Once again, I took him to his home and once again told his mother to please not do that again. She actually tried to tell me that it was my neighborly duty to watch him and I told her that if she sent him tomorrow, I wouldn't be there because of a doctor's appointment. She said that as a babysitter, I should have given her several days notice about this. I angrily told her I was not a babysitter and then went home. The next morning, I made my 7 a.m. appointment. Blood work, that is why it was so early. I did some grocery shopping afterward and it was about 10 a.m. when I got home. The poor kid was waiting for me on my porch. He had been there for nearly three hours and the little guy was scared and hungry. That night when I took the kid home, I was angry. I told her how this kid was scared and alone. She actually said that she had told me I hadn't given her enough time to find anyone else and that his being alone was my fault. I pointed at her and said, I am not a babysitter. Don't send him over again. That night, this woman had her adult nephew call me to scream at me for not being home when his poor aunt dropped her son off. How dare I leave a kid alone like that? I told the nephew that his aunt knew I wasn't home, so it was her that left the kid all alone. I said that I had repeatedly asked his aunt not to send the kid over anymore, and I was not a babysitter. This nephew freaked out at me when I said that, and I hung up on him screaming at me. This worked for two wonderful quiet days, then right back to it. I tried everything, but this woman insisted that it was my neighborly duty to babysit and would tell me as such. Finally, I decided that to solve this problem, I would just get a job outside of my home, and that way she would have to stop. I was too much of a pacifist back then, I no longer am. I landed an interview for a position at the local library, and I was ecstatic. I told the woman to keep her son home because I had arranged for my kids to stay with their grandmother while I went to this interview. The next morning, I drove to my mother-in-law's house and took my kids inside. When I went to leave, I found this woman's kid waiting for me in my car. She had actually followed me there and put her son in my unlocked car and then zoomed off while I was dropping off my boys. My mother-in-law wasn't the most flexible person in the world and she adamantly refused to watch an extra kid. I had to cancel my interview. I was livid. I toyed with several ideas at this moment. I could take the kid to her job and leave him with her or I could call the police and CPS. I really wasn't sure how stable this woman's job was and I didn't want to get her fired. And when I went to go call the CPS, I chickened out because it really wouldn't be fair to the kid. Besides, I had heard really scary stories about CPS. In the end, I just waited for her to come home. I left the kid at my house with my husband and I stomped over to her house and met her before she even got out of the car. I shouted at her. I told her she was dense, stupid, moronic, and crazy. I told her that she had lost me my job interview and if she sent her kid over to be watched again, I was going to call CPS and the police. I told her that she was violating my space and if it took going to court to get her to knock it off, then so be it. She then put her hand on her hip and in her most snotty tone, she said, Well, if you didn't want to sit with him, all you had to do was tell me. I really do not know how I kept from punching her right then and there. This comment was so crazy. I turned on my heels to start stomping home when I saw her husband pulling up. Now this was the first time I had ever met her husband. He worked at a job that only allowed him to be home on weekends. I can't blame him. I wouldn't want to be around her either. But when she saw him, she turned tail and ran into her house. He saw that I was upset and asked me what had happened. I told him, told him all of it, especially the incident at my mother-in-law's. The poor man was shocked. He had been told that I was being paid and he had been giving her money to pay me. He had no idea all this had been going on and he was very, very apologetic over the whole thing. In fact, he apologized again to my husband when he came over to pick up his son. Finally, finally, she stopped sending her kid over. Later, I heard from others that she was bad-mouthing me and warning folks about what a horrid babysitter I was, but I took that as a favor. 
I didn't want to babysit any of the kids other than my own, and I still hate doing so. The kid came over only once in a while after that to play with my kids, after he called first to get permission, exactly the way it should be done. I'm sure his dad had something to do with that, because the kid only came over on weekends. This is one of a few stories I have involving this crazy lady. Her only entertainment in life seems to be seeing how bizarre she can act in this neighborhood. I'm luckier than my other neighbors in the fact that she leaves me alone now, and I'm very happy with that. Karen has a total freak out at Walmart. This, this I will never forget. I used to work at my local Walmart, but I only worked there for three months then quit because I couldn't work the schedule I was on. I worked the graveyard shift. That means I worked from 10 p.m. to 7 a.m. Fun. I quit because I would sleep all day and be up all night, have no time for family or friends, and I couldn't do that nor was I able to switch to the day shift since there were no openings for the day shift. After three weeks of me quitting, I returned to do some shopping and to return my vest and name tag. I was standing at the customer service, waiting for the general manager to come get the vest and tag. As I was waiting, this woman, aka Karen, walks right up to me and crossed her arms and snarls at me. Me, can I help you? Karen, yes, I've been waiting for you to stop talking for nearly an hour. Me, I've been here for five minutes. What do you want? Karen, I need help. I want to buy a TV, but I can't carry it. Me, uh, I don't work here, lady. The customer service girl holds in a giggle as she tries to calm down the Karen. Yes, you do. You do work here. I saw you just a month ago working here. Me, I quit like three weeks ago. I no longer work here. If you want help, how about you lose the bad Karen attitude of yours and ask nicely for help before demanding someone. No wonder why people think you're a jerk. We had problems with her multiple times. Karen goes on and on how she's going to get me fired for this and how she knows the general manager. Me. Go ahead. I don't care. I don't work here. I put the tag and vest down on the counter and did my shopping. The general manager comes up and fist bumps me as it was our way of saying hey to each other. He tells me what Karen said and laughed. General manager. I swear that woman is crazy. I tried to tell her that you don't work here. Me. That's what I told her. Manager. Don't worry. If she does anything, she will be banned. I finished up my shopping and what do you know, Karen lost it on the manager for being so inconsiderate of her being harassed by me and next thing she knew, she was banned for giving him problems. Interviewed someone who claimed to have done my job at my former employer when I worked there 9 years ago. I work for an IT consulting firm. A minor part of my job is to perform phone screens on prospective hires. I have a long background in IT, so I'm used to resume padding. I try to judge a person's actual technical ability, their ability to fit into our company, how they would do as a consultant, and try and get a gauge of their character. We have a widespread of technical prowess on staff, so I focus on the person. After years in IT, I think I can do this pretty well. Last week, the owner sent a resume and called me to do a phone screen of a prospective employee. I happily agreed, not having read the resume. I finished my evening and went to bed. The next day, I read the resume. This guy claimed to have worked at my former employer, a university, nine years ago when I worked there, doing my job as a student worker working to gain two master's degrees in two years. Before you start laughing, keep in mind, this will mess with you. You don't expect this level of dishonesty on a resume. I started asking myself when I actually worked at the former employer what I may have missed, what could have happened. I actually reached out to my former coworkers about this person. I managed a lot of the student workers, but not all of them, so I thought maybe I was forgetting someone. Nobody knew him. It was suggested that perhaps the resume had formatting errors or he was talking about the wrong university. There is another school in town with a very similar name, so this is not unheard of. I decided to give the candidate the benefit of the doubt, but I wanted to be sure about my former workplace. I called the registrar's office to verify the degrees. After much checking, we could find no record that he even attended the school. I should have called off the interview, but at this point, I was still trying to give the benefit of the doubt. I called him on time and started the interview as normal. I explained the position, told him this would be a technical interview, and answered his first questions. We started going through his resume, and I asked a technical question relating to his claimed experience. That is when I first heard the mechanical keyboard. I cannot be certain, no video but I am fairly confident that he was googling the answers to questions I was asking. 
I adjusted and started asking follow-up questions that would be too hard to quickly search for. He was unable to answer those. After a few minutes, we got to my former employer. I asked who his supervisor was. I have never heard of the person he claimed. I let him know I worked there at the same time he was claiming, in the IT department, like he was claiming. He responded with, oh crap. I explained briefly that I was the person that would have been his boss and that he was claiming to have done my job. He tried to tell me that he worked in a different building. This is when I got mad. I told him that there was only one IT department for this rather small school. I had to stop myself from calling out all the crap. Instead, I just ended the interview. I wasted 45 minutes of my life. Well, he wasted it. I called the employment agency that recommended him and told them everything, including the bogus degrees. I then called several other agencies and gave them the scoop, complete with his LinkedIn account and resume that showed the same false information. The odds of me interviewing this jerk were insane. I find this both ridiculously funny and infuriating. Apple's holier-than-thou attitude is their undoing in court. About a year and a half ago, I was having issues with both my MacBook and iPhone and went on to schedule a Genius Bar appointment. This used to be an easy task. You just went to the support side and scheduled one. But over time, Apple has foolishly attempted to reduce the load on the Genius Bars by putting up various roadblocks to getting an appointment. I assume they've just decided that this is cheaper than hiring more staff and that most of the customers are rabid enough to still buy Apple tech despite the blow this causes to decent customer service. After finally jumping through a number of hoops to get a Genius Bar appointment, I'm prompted to enter my Apple ID and password. I'm told that, since it's been three months, I need to change it, for what is now probably the tenth time since having that Apple ID. I can continue to use it on the App Store and iCloud and stuff, but if I want a service appointment, I must change it. Having gone through this for the last several times to get an appointment, I finally hit my wit's end, decided it's an unnecessary step to just get my product serviced and escalate the matter through the Better Business Bureau. Apple's initial response to the Better Business Bureau is a form letter saying that I need to just change the password because it's in my best interest for security reasons and that they won't make any exceptions. I respond again, indicating that this is bad customer service and incongruent with the Apple credo, customer service principles, that all employees are trained in. Their next response was that Apple considers this matter closed. I hate that response. It's corporate speak for, you're not worth our time anymore, go away. The Better Business Bureau closed the case shortly thereafter. I do some research and determine that, through my Apple Care Plus policy that I was paying for on both devices, there was actually no catch-all clause for why Apple could refuse to service the device. There were several exclusions, but arbitrary account security requirements were not part of them. I file suit in small claims court for replacement value of the laptop and phone. Here's when things got interesting. I show up to the court date and the case is called. I come up to my podium and at the defendant's podium appears the manager from the store I used to work at. It was in the same county as the court, but significantly farther away than an Apple store that was actually a mile from the courthouse. I never confirmed this, but I think Apple didn't pay attention to the details of the complaint on the form, just did a name lookup and assumed that because I had previously worked at the store that this was some employment dispute. The judge asks me to explain why I am suing and in about a minute, I'm able to concisely explain that Apple was putting up an unnecessary and extra contractual blockade to me, getting a service appointment for my broken devices. So I was suing to replace the devices. The judge then turns to the store manager, who has arrived at court in a t-shirt and jeans. I'm in a full suit, out of respect for the court. But before asking for Apple's side of the story, asks if the manager is a lawyer. The manager says he is not. The judge says that since my state's law requires that only a chief executive or registered agent can represent a company in court, or they have to hire a lawyer to remove it to a higher district court. The manager responds that he understands, but that he's happy to set up a genius bar appointment right here, right now, at my convenience to get the products repaired. The judge deems this reasonable. We agree on a time for me to come into my old store for service, and the case is continued for two weeks out on the chance that things don't work out. I attend my appointment and the technician is able to resolve all of my issues and in addition, a senior Apple technician contacts me by email to indicate that he's overridden the password expiration requirement on my Apple ID and I will never have to change it again. Cool deal, but I'm still out $60 for filing this court case to actually get things moving along. I appear for the continued court date 
and the same manager appears again too. The docket is especially busy on this date and we have a different judge who is slashing through cases. No nonsense. We're called and I indicate that while we were able to resolve the problems with my equipment since the original trial and am no longer seeking replacement value for my products, I should not have had to sue Apple to get this type of treatment that aligned with their contractual obligations to me as an Apple Care Plus customer and believe that I should be awarded the $60 in court fees. The judge turns to the store manager and asks if he is a lawyer. Manager says no. Judge too gives him the same spiel. Manager retorts that he still believes that the court fees shouldn't be Apple's responsibility because blah blah blah. And judge, pressed for time, turns to me and says, I assume you don't want to have to come back here again for them to get a lawyer. I say no, thinking that he's going to give me the full $60, but instead he says, Okay, then you'll just split it so that we don't have to waste any more time on this. $30 to the plaintiff. According to my state's laws, a prevailing party gets all of their court costs. As such, I really disagree with the way the judge handled that, splitting it because he was in a hurry. I reach out to Apple's paralegal who had emailed me right after the original trial to confirm the genius bar appointment, cite the relevant law, and say that the judge was pretty clearly in the wrong, and ask Apple to just cut me a check for the full $60. Otherwise, I'd have to appeal, which was an extra $125. They would surely lose and then owe me $185. I was more or less appealing their common sense. They didn't have any, responding that they would follow the court's judgment only and cut a check for $30. I think their pompousness continued in assuming that I was bluffing about the appeal. So I appealed. Since the small claims court is a subordinate of the district court, it actually got appealed to the highest court in the county, the circuit court. This is big boy court. No BSing. I appear for my court date and again, the same manager shows up. Judge is a bouncy guy in a bow tie, clearly had his coffee and is pleasant to everyone. I present my case that the lower court only awarded me partial costs and the state law required that I get the entire amount since judgment was entered in my favor. Judge turns to the manager. Are you a lawyer? He says no, but he has a letter from Apple's chief legal counsel saying that it's okay with them that the manager represents them. The judge does not like this and his demeanor changes instantly. Apple does not decide what you can or cannot do in my courtroom. You need an attorney, so we'll probably need to continue this case. Judge turns to me. Do you object to a continuance for the defendant to get an attorney? I say, yes, I do, your honor, because they've actually been told three times now that they need to have a lawyer and they keep disrespecting this court by sending this same layman to argue on their behalf. Judge turns to the manager and with a sarcastic grin and obviously fake, it's out of my hands hand gesture says, sorry, judgment is entered in my favor for $185. As if that wasn't good enough, after 30 days, Apple still hasn't paid. I reach out to the paralegal again and they say they are still looking into their options as if they were going to appeal to the state supreme court, which had to have been done within those 30 days. Again, Apple thinks that they're too good to follow court instructions or do what's best for them, but they seem to have forgotten that I used to work for them. I have my credit union look up one of the old ACH transactions from my payroll and I ask them what bank that was drafted from. They tell me Wachovia. I go back to court, file garnishment proceedings against Apple via Wachovia. I was able to skip the discovery portion since I already knew where they were keeping at least $185. And Wachovia, of course, cuts me a check within days. Karen breaks my phone because I refuse to hand it over. Cast. We've got Entitled Mom, Entitled Kid, Nice Dad, and Me. So on to the story. About five years ago, I was at a family reunion with over 60 people I had never met. I was bored, so I started playing Call of Duty Mobile on my brand new iPhone 6. I had worked hard to get that phone all summer. I played for a few minutes and saw Entitled Kid, who was about 10 I think, a few feet away from me looking bored out of his mind staring intently at me. Me feeling bad because I was feeling the same way beckons for him to come over when Entitled Kid comes in. He watches me for a while, which I don't mind. Then, after about 30 minutes, he asked me my account name. Entitled Kid pulls up the app on his phone. Can you tell me your account name? You have lots of stuff. Me. Sure, it's username. You can friend me if you want. Entitled Kid writes it down on his phone. Okay, what's your password? Me. No, I'm not telling you. This is my account. Understand, I have spent over $50 on this game and many hours on it as well. 
so you can understand why I did not want to share it with him. Entitled Kid's face turns red, he gets mad and storms off. After a few minutes, I think I'm in the clear, when out of nowhere, here comes Entitled Mom. What have you done to my kid? Me. He wanted my game password, and I told him he couldn't have it, trying to reason with Karen. But I would gladly help him make an account on his phone. Entitled Mom, brushing off the last line. Then what is it? Me. I told you, I will not give it away. It's my account, and I've spent money on it. How dare you? Why are you being so disrespectful? After further arguing, she realizes that she cannot get my password, and she asks how much it was worth. Entitled Mom. Well, how much did you spend on it? Me. Thinking it's starting to end because she's starting to calm down. 50 or so dollars. Entitled Mom. What? I'm not spending that much on some game. Just let him use your account. Me. Getting angry because I do not want to give this lady my account. No ma'am. I am not going to give you my account information. Entitled Mom is so mad and taken aback. She rushes forward, grabs my phone, and throws it at the ground. I was so shocked about what just happened, and I realize it's quiet. I look around to see people staring at us. Entitled Mom grabbed Entitled Kid by the arm and stormed off. Soon after, many people were reassuring me when Nice Dad came over. He told me that this was his wife and that he would pay for my phone. A few days later, a package arrived in the mail. Sure enough, it was an iPhone 6S. And even better, after all the other family reunions, I've never seen Entitled Mom or Entitled Kid again. And I'm still friends with Nice Dad to this very day. What did I take away from this? 1. I have no idea why someone so nice would marry a jerk like that. 2. I now have a better phone and a crazy story. 3. I will never be like Karen in my life. Speaking of iPhones, do you like iPhones or not really? Entitled Dad tries to bully me at the comic shop. Allow me to set the scene. This all happened when I was 17, when I was working at a comics and collectibles store in my small town. We were a very tight-knit store family, and about 80% of the customers we would see in a day were our regular customers. On the day in question, my coworker, we'll get to him later, was taking his well-deserved lunch in the back room, away from the main store. Although I was pretty new at the time, I was fine handling the store by myself for an hour or so, and it was a slow day, a few weeks after Christmas. Enter the entitled dad, with his unfortunate five to six year old son in tow. Entitled dad is extremely well dressed, visibly wealthy, and barely even glances at me as he walks up to the register. I don't recognize him, which means he's not a regular. As he comes in, he's holding the box for a mid-range Transformers some assembly required figurine. The box is open at one end, and the frames that hold the punch out pieces are sticking out of the top, along with some of the plastic packaging and directions. I can hear loose pieces rattling around inside. He unceremoniously drops the box on the counter. We need to exchange this for another one. Now, if you know anything about small businesses, especially ones that sell collectibles, you'll know that return slash exchange policies are pretty non-existent. We just don't have the profit cushion to make up for it. However, my boss is a softy, and for regulars, or in cases of broken merchandise, he sometimes makes an exception. Tentatively, I tell Entitled Dad that we don't usually do returns or exchanges, but I ask if there was a problem with the toy, and I ask if he has his receipt. Entitled Dad is already on the verge of snapping. My son and I couldn't put it together. Listen to me, I'm not asking you for a refund. We're just going to exchange it for another one. All the pieces are there. I shouldn't have to keep every receipt. I bought it here. You clearly sell these toys and he immediately hauls his poor kid over to the shelves where we display our transformers. Now, I don't believe for a second that all of the pieces are in that box, especially since it looks like they stuffed it all back in without trying to even make it fit. I'm a non-confrontational type of person, and my anxiety was already bad enough at this point, so I realize I am not equipped to handle this entitled dad. So I go get my coworker, who will call D. D is the kind of person that you picture when you think of don't mess with me energy. He used to be a tattoo artist, he's covered in ink and piercings, always wears band tees, has a dark beard, tall and fit, etc. He carries a stainless steel cane for some leg issues, but in his hands that cane looks like a weapon. However, he's always extremely kind and professional up until the exact second that you upset him. Even I'm a little afraid of D to be honest. 
I peek into the back room, already feeling terrible for interrupting Dee's lunch, and tell him I need his help with a customer who's demanding to return a toy. He heads back out into the main store area with me, and I see his expression go sour the moment he spots the busted open box sitting on our counter. Dee turns to Entitled Dad and asks, So, you're wanting to return this toy, is that right? Entitled Dad absolutely flips his crap. No, I am exchanging it for another toy, because I bought it here and my son can't put his Christmas present together. He rounds on me. What did you tell him? I told you it was an exchange. D cuts him off, steadily approaching rage mode. Sir, I cannot put this back on the shelf. It's open, the box is bent, and we don't sell used merchandise. We don't offer returns or exchanges. It said so on your receipt when you bought it. Entitled Dad is shouting even louder now. This is ridiculous. I bought it here. Just put it back in the box then. All the pieces are there. If I can't even figure it out, it's probably defective. D is not having it. You expect me to accept this on your word that all the pieces are there? Then sell it to another customer with half the pieces broken out already? This toy is for ages 12 and up, and if you can't figure out how to put it together, that's not my problem. If you want a new toy, you're going to have to pay for it. Otherwise, you need to leave. I'm practically blacked out from fear of confrontation at this point. I don't remember the particulars of the rest of their shouting match, but I do remember making eye contact with Entitled Dad's poor kid who looked absolutely humiliated by his dad's behavior. In the end, Dee makes it incredibly clear that he's not going to accept Entitled Dad's busted up toy and that Entitled Dad needs to leave or we will call the police. Fuming, Entitled Dad snatches the box back and drags his kid away all the while threatening us with the Better Business Bureau, bad online reviews, I'm never shopping here again, etc, etc. Still fuming himself, D looks over and asks me if I'm alright. I nod. If that jerk comes back here, you come get me, okay? I nod again, and D disappears into the back room to finish his lunch. And no, Entitled Dad did not come back. Do you have any collectibles or things that you've put together yourself? I think those are so cool. Please let me know. Karen from my church goes crazy on me. Okay, I should preface this by saying this happened about 12 years ago now. I had mostly forgotten about this incident until I read a story about Christian entitled parents and went, oh, hey, I know some of those. This takes place a few months after I had started going to a new church after my grandmother, who I was living with, got a flyer for a vacation Bible study the church was doing. I had enjoyed it and ended up going back every Sunday morning and Wednesday night. We were new to the area and didn't have a church to go to yet, so finding one I enjoyed was a blessing. I was one of the older kids there, at 11, and there was only one other kid there my exact age and he usually only showed up every two weeks or so. There was this one girl, however, that got really attached to me. She was a few years younger and her brother was just a year older than her. He wasn't nearly as attached, but still liked to get me to play with them, and these kids were actually the pastor's kids. At the time, I was really, really into Yu-Gi-Oh, and my grandmother had just bought me some cards, and I was ecstatic. I was talking about it to anyone that would willingly listen to me, and that meant bringing my cards to church and talking about it with people there. This included the girl, but oh boy, had talking to her about it been a huge mistake. Once the services were over and everyone was getting ready to leave, the pastor's wife comes to me and asks me to come talk to her in another room. I follow her, thinking maybe she had something for me. We weren't exactly well off, so it wouldn't be the first time I left with more than I had arrived with. Anyway, I get to this room and inside already are the pastor's mother and another woman from the church whose name I can't remember, so I'm going to call her Nancy because she reminded me of a Nancy. Nancy was my hero in this situation. The pastor's wife sits down in front of me and begins to tell me that she doesn't like the way I was talking to her daughter. I'm very much confused at this point because I definitely wasn't being mean or saying anything bad. She then continues on to tell me that I should not be talking to her daughter about demons and that's when it dawns on me that she's talking about my Yu-Gi-Oh cards. My throat felt tight at that point and I was trying so hard to not start crying right there and then because I couldn't begin to understand why I was getting berated over talking about my cards and I try to explain that it's just a game and a show I like. She tells me she knows that, but it's still completely unacceptable and she doesn't want me talking to her kids again, ever. Not just about the cards, about anything. And then she tells me I can go, so I rush out of there to the van that brought me there. 
I go home and completely bawl my eyes out. The thing was, this was about the time my anxiety really got the better of me, even if I didn't know that's what it was back then. Just the thought that I was going to be in trouble with my grandmother and her husband was enough to send me into a full-blown panic attack and lock myself in my room. I ended up skipping the next Sunday school by pretending to be sick. Nancy and her husband actually showed up at my home the day after I missed. They asked that I don't take anything the pastor and his wife say too seriously. That because they're well off and send their kids to a good Catholic school, that they could be a bit uppity. They told me they hoped I would continue coming to the church because they loved having me and that made me feel a little better. And I did enjoy going to that church. So next Wednesday evening rolls around, the van shows up and I go to church again. I wish I hadn't. I get there and church service proceeds as normal, but we stay behind a little longer to make Christmas decorations before we leave. The kids keep trying to talk to me and I try to ignore them. The boy, once realizing I wasn't going to play with him like usual, goes to play somewhere else. The girl, however, does not. As I said before, she had been quite attached to me and kept trying to get me to talk to her. I was afraid of getting in trouble again, so I crack and tell her that I'm sorry, but I'm not allowed to talk to her anymore. She looks confused and hurt, which in turn made me hurt. She was a sweet kid, but I shouldn't have even said that because her mother comes storming over, scolding me for ignoring her kid, and I'm just so, so confused. She had literally told me the week before that she didn't want me talking to them at all. She then tells me that because I was so rude, I could take them into the playroom and watch them while everyone cleaned up the tables and leftover supplies, and I'm just standing there, dumbfounded and trying so hard not to cry. She tells me to go on then, but before I can say anything, Nancy swoops in to save me. She tells the pastor's wife that, actually, she had gotten a phone call from my grandmother and that I needed to go home right away. She tries to argue that the van can't leave until they're done cleaning up, and Nancy tells her that's okay because she'll be taking me home. I start crying as soon as we get into the car, and Nancy, the sweetheart she was, stopped at a gas station and bought me a cocoa and a donut to try and make me feel better, so I was a little less blubbery by the time I got home. In the end, I was too afraid to ever go back to that church. The next time the van came around to pick me up, my grandmother had to go out and let the drivers, who were also very good people, know that I wasn't coming this time, or ever again, while I hid under my covers, too ashamed to face them myself. I spent a long time thinking it was my fault, that what I had done was inherently wrong. I even ended up giving my cards to a friend because I couldn't look at them without wanting to throw up. This is the first time I've told anyone outside of my grandmother about this situation. Obviously, looking back now, I know I was no way in the wrong and the pastor's wife in no way made sense with the way she treated me. Speaking of Yu-Gi-Oh, did you ever have Yu-Gi-Oh cards of your own? Or how about Pokemon cards? Entitled Parent Tries to Take My Lightsaber So, I practice lightsaber fighting as a hobby and have been for about 3 years. Being a lightsaber, I prefer to practice in the dark because I enjoy the lighting. Before then, I had had a stick that I put a handle and duct tape on for practice. A couple years ago, I finally got a lightsaber from Ultra Sabers for about $100 and got really into my practice. It's very different balance-wise, and because I've mostly lived in apartments my whole life, I usually go to nearby parks or wait for no one to be outside. Well, one night last fall I was at my local park for some practice of my forms. About 10 minutes in, Entitled Mom and her maybe about 10 year old kid came over. He was holding one of those flimsy plastic lightsabers in his hand. As I realized they were approaching, I stopped practicing because I don't want anyone accidentally getting hurt, even more so in the dark. Entitled Mom Hey, can you duel my son? He just wants to have some fun. Me Well, if he was wearing safety gear I would, and if he maybe had a better lightsaber. I don't want him to get hurt, and I actually practice dueling. Entitled Mom It's not a sharp blade or anything. It won't hurt him. At this point, the kid approaches me and I can barely see that he has extended the telescopic blade. Me Doesn't matter. We use protection because with these blades they are very sturdy and in the right hands can actually cause very real damage. Thwack! The kid decided to strike my leg. It only sounded bad. The plastic on those has a lot of give for a reason. Me, turning to the kid. Don't hit anyone, even with a toy weapon unless you personally know them. Entitled Mom. Don't listen to him. The Jedi strike people in every movie, don't they? At this point, I realize I'm talking to a psychopath of some sort. I turn off the light and start heading back home. But that was apparently a mistake. Entitled Mom. 
Wait, can we at least trade for your lightsaber? My son really likes purple. Me. No, the blade on this is going to be far too long for him. And I paid over $100 for it. Oh, please. You didn't pay that much. I bet it was $30 tops. And you're not willing to fight. Why should you keep it if you aren't going to use it? Me. I do use it. Mostly for exercise right now. But I have several friends who want to get their own. And I plan to make a club of it. And I've practiced the combat steps for almost three years. I'm sure I could outduel your son in just a few seconds. It wouldn't be the best experience, and I don't want him to get hurt. That's why I didn't lift my blade when he hit me. I'm being kind, and now I'm going home. I don't know what they did after that, but I have since moved. And a $20 toy for a $100 pseudo weapon is nothing to ever ask for. There are only three. They can do what they want. Okay. So a few days ago, I went to a bowling place with my dad and my brother because we were bored and we came across two different entitled parents. I'll post the second story in a few days. So like normal, we got our bowling shoes on, went to our lanes, and beside us was a mom and four girls around three. We were halfway through the first game, but then something happened. Cast. We've got me. We've got my brother. We've got my dad. We've got entitled kids, entitled mom, and the bowling employee. So like I said before, we were about halfway through the game and the people next to us just finished. We thought they would pack up and leave, but no. Two games was not enough for them. Entitled Kid 1. Why don't we race the bowling balls down the lane? That would be fun. Entitled Kid 2. Okay. So they grab a few balls and do exactly what they said. Now, I don't have a problem with what they were doing, but after they rolled down the lane, the balls would get stuck. And since we were sharing the balls, we didn't have many balls left. So my dad got up and politely says, Excuse me girls, the balls you are rolling down the lane are getting stuck and we can't use them anymore. So could you please stop? Entitled kids. Okay. So we continue playing with half of these balls, but then the girls start doing it again. So a bowling employee tells them to stop, but they keep on doing it as soon as the employee leaves. Now my dad is mad, so he gets up again, but instead this time he talks to the entitled mom. Dad. Excuse me. Your kids are getting the ball stuck, and I have already asked them to stop, but they haven't. Can you ask them to stop? Entitled Mom. They're only three. They can do what they want, so I don't care if you want them to stop. Buzz off. Her language kind of surprised me at this point, and there was only one ball left. So I get up to get it before the kids can take it again, but Entitled Mom can see me doing it and trips me. Me. Ouch. Stop being a crybaby. You don't deserve the balls. My brother. You're being very rude and selfish. Can we please have the ball and an apology for tripping him over? So she gets up and throws the ball at my brother. Luckily she missed and screams, Take it then. And you know what the entitled kids say next? But we want it, mom. At this point, they're being so loud that the employee comes back. Employee. What seems to be the problem? Entitled mom. They stole our bowling balls. Entitled kid. Yeah, they stole it. Employee. Excuse me, entitled mom. You need to leave right now. Why? They hurt my babies and stole our bowling balls. They should leave. Employee. Well, after I told your girls to stop bowling, I looked over to see if they did, and I saw the whole thing unfold. Now leave, before I charge you with assault. For what? For tripping him over and throwing a bowling ball at them. Now buzz off. So the entitled mom walks off, and we are happy. Employee. I'm so sorry you had to deal with that. If you want, I can give you a free game. Dad. Thank you so much. So we get the balls back and continue playing. So the second story will come out in a few days. And sorry if there are typos or spelling errors. I'm on a mobile device. Do you like going bowling or not really? Lady upset because a stranger didn't comfort her in a public restroom. This story is of family friends who had the displeasure of working closely with this woman at their job. So for a little context, this person who we will refer to as entitled parent works with our family friend and is that kind of person who thinks they're friends with everyone they talk to. But in reality, no one really cares to have them around. Entitled Parent also had a pair of pet rats whom she talked about and treated almost exactly like you would human kids. If family friend ever mentioned their kid to other coworkers, Entitled Parent would butt in and begin comparing the totally comparable struggle of raising a kid versus rats. It's also important to note that family friend loves animals and has many pets, so they understand both the struggles of raising people and pets and knows firsthand that it's a completely different realm. Family friend is also a fairly nice person 
So any time entitled parent would bud into these convos, flaunting her precious rats, they would never say anything to entitled parent. Now comes the story. Entitled parent had sadly lost both of her rats, and as you could imagine, this lady was completely distraught. Many of us know the pain of losing a beloved pet, and family friend was no stranger to it, as they've lost many in their lifetime, so they sympathized with entitled parent in this troubling time. Family friend personally reached out to entitled parent, sending their condolences, to which entitled parent replied with something along the lines of, Thank you. It's just so hard, you know. I've gone to the bathroom like 10 times today to cry. I even left a meeting early because I just can't take this pain. Later that same day, family friend was on their lunch break and a sniffling entitled parent came to join them. Entitled parent, of course, began to voice her dismay unprovoked and went on to discuss what travesty had just befell her. Entitled parent told family friend she went to the bathroom for yet another cry break, and as she sat there, sobbing on a public toilet, she heard someone walk in. The random stranger went along their business and left the restroom. Normal thing to do, right? Well, not to entitled parent. I was told entitled parent said something along the lines of, That stupid jerk didn't even ask if I was okay, or offer to console me. What kind of monster do you have to be to leave someone crying in the bathroom? Family friend was absolutely shocked at such a comment. How is not confronting a random crying stranger who is in a random bathroom stall something worthy of being called a jerk? Even still, family friend is non-confrontational, so nothing was said to entitled parent. Entitled parent even relayed this story to other coworkers in hopes for some sympathy to which none was received. This type of behavior still continued in the next following weeks according to family friend, an entitled parent was getting on everyone's nerves yet nothing was ever said. This was the end of family friend's story with entitled parent. But even still, they still try to understand why Entitled Parent was like that, if it was just entitlement or some other factor causing her to be like this. We still have no clue to the answer of this, nor the answer to why someone would go out of their way to hide the fact they are crying, yet also wish to get consolation for it at the same time. My Entitled Aunt Tries to Snatch My Necklace From Me Gets Told To Never Come Back To Our House Again this happened to my mom and me a long time ago, although I don't remember anything as I was very young. Before getting to the main story, I'd like to give you some backstory on my aunt. So we've got Entitled Aunt, we've got Cousin, we've got my mom, we've got my dad, and me. Entitled Aunt was the only sister of seven brothers, so you can imagine how spoiled she was. She'd purposefully make her parents buy jewelry and other expensive items which they couldn't afford and keep a family of ten afloat. In short, she got everything she wanted, and being an only sister slash daughter, had the sole attention and love of her parents and brothers. My dad especially really loved his sister, and to be honest, didn't care for my mom at all. He was also the favorite brother of Entitled Aunt. Entitled Aunt was married to a guy who couldn't exactly afford her lavish spending, and she relied on my dad for everything she wanted. The moment my mom was married into the family, arranged marriage because that's how things work over here. Entitled Aunt got very jealous, mainly because of the fact that until then she was the apple of his eye. And since my dad landed a pretty good job solely due to his hard work and built his own house, not to mention took in his mother and his mentally handicapped younger brother because no one else could be bothered to look after them, she could easily leech off of him. She would harass my mother for any reason she could find. She wouldn't let dad buy anything for mom. She would make mom do all the work in the whole household, including hers. And even though she didn't stay at the house, she'd bring her laundry from her own house so mom could wash it. When mom was heavily pregnant with me and obviously wasn't supposed to do any tenuous work, she'd still force her to do everything, including heavy lifting. Mom eventually left to her own home a month before her due date and got the rest she deserved being taken care of by my sweet grandma. After I was born, mom got a job as a teacher. It was her lifelong dream, even though she had to pay money to the school for it. Again, it's a government job, and this is how it is for everyone here. My mom definitely wasn't cheating and was qualified for said job. Mom, having no other way, decided to ask dad for the money required, which he was ready to give until entitled aunt storms in and shuts it down. Eventually, mom had to borrow money from her sister and land the job. There's tons of stories about her which I couldn't actually believe because I couldn't fathom the possibility that someone could be so entitled. Getting to the main story. After I was born, my dad completely shifted focus from entitled aunt to me 
because I was and still am his only child. Entitled Aunt didn't like this, but knew how much dad wouldn't like it if she did something to his kid. As I said, dad has a lot of siblings and he was the second youngest, so everyone else was already married and had kids of their own. When I was around two years old, dad's mother decided to buy every grandchild a silver pendant and a special gold one for cousin as she was entitled aunt's kid. Mom bought a nice platinum chain for the pendant with her hard-earned money. My dad then decided to buy a nice diamond pendant because he thought it looked good with the chain and switched out the silver pendant. Entitled Aunt couldn't afford to buy a matching gold necklace for the pendant, so she pestered my dad to buy one for cousin, to which he complied. This was before she knew what he had bought for me. To clarify, as far as I know, cousin isn't an entitled jerk and I like her a lot. A few days later, she comes over with cousin. I was in the cradle and since we had just come back from a wedding, I was still wearing the necklace. Entitled Aunt sees this and belittles mom, thinking it was fake, and brags about how cousin got a lovely gold pendant and matching chain. Mom didn't say anything and went on with her work. Dad came home and tells Entitled Aunt about the necklace during random chit chat. Entitled Aunt then asks Dad to give her the necklace for cousin. Dad says no and reminds her that she just bought cousin a gold chain. Entitled Aunt loses her crap. I think she just wasn't used to hearing no from Dad starts screaming about how her angel deserved it more and that dad should give it to cousin as they didn't have as much money as we did. Dad firmly said no and tells her how even if he wanted to, he couldn't as the chain was bought by mom. Entitled aunt tries to snatch the necklace from my neck which promptly made me cry which apparently annoyed her even more. Mom swats her hand away, livid at the fact that she was not only stealing but hurting me in the process to which she had a whole meltdown bawling about how dad didn't care for her or cousin at all, and all his attention went to me. Dad stood his ground and said no. Then this person decides to tell dad, who literally catered to her every wish how worthless of a brother he is and how his daughter is going to turn up just like him. I think dad just snapped at this point. He told her to leave his house and how he's so tired of dealing with her crap. She then angrily left the house. Next day, she came back, again, bringing some homemade snacks and sweet talking about how she just had a mood swing and how she was so sorry. Dad entertained this for a while, thinking that she was genuinely sorry, but then she tried to ask for the necklace again, and the same argument ensued, after which she was kicked out and told never to come back to his house again. I guess after that, she understood her place and that Dad wasn't going to bend to her will anymore, especially if it was regarding me. She passed away a couple of years later. My mom rejoiced when she heard this. Do you get along with your brothers and sisters or do you usually fight with them? Please let me know. Karen loses it at the butcher shop. I went to the Amish stores to get goods because around here there are Amish and Mennonite not too far away from my city and they have great deals on staples plus they are not crowded and all but ignore me unless necessary. The limited stock means most English, as they call us, only shop there when they are retired or can't get stuff and they live in the tiny town adjacent to my larger city. I got flour, yeast, and some other things, but they didn't have any vegetables or meat. That happened since they open at 7 a.m. and Amish and Mennonite get up early and it was 10 a.m. No worries, I'll go to the butcher, but the Amish butcher was closed, so I head over to the tiny butcher in my city I frequent as I know after Monday, I'll be home for a minimum of two weeks. I get there and the coolers are all but bare as are the shelves, but I see the butcher is still packaging some items and so I get in the longest line I've ever seen there. I read the signs and know the limits so as to not be greedy. The man in front finally got to the butcher and apparently didn't read the limits, so they have to tell him no several times, but he gets the two pounds of bacon they said was the limit, leaving what looked like less than a pound of bacon. No worries, first come, first served. I only wanted a pound for my family anyways. He gets the last brisket and the last of the chicken thighs. I'm mentally adjusting order because again, he was first. He can get whatever he likes. Halfway through his order, I notice entitled mom and entitled daughter are talking loudly behind me, almost telling me how I need to order and not order things because they wanted them. I ignore them but they keep getting into my personal space and talking about their needs because they're a family, because good moms never shop alone. It's my turn at the counter and entitled mom says to the butcher, 
Can I go first? I'm in a hurry. My family needs us to get home. I care for my diabetic son. He says, That's up to my batch of crazy. She was here first. I respond, Actually, I am immunocompromised, and my diabetic husband has our kids at home. She huffs, but knows that she won't be getting ahead of me. Entitled daughter whispered, Mommy, brother is biadetic? Entitled mom shushed her. I order the bacon first, saying with a smile, I would like a pound of bacon, but it looks like it might be shy of that, so I'll take whatever's there if that's okay. Entitled mom loses her crap. You can't do that. She can't take all the bacon. That's not fair. My family needs it. I roll my eyes and keep going. She pokes me. You did that on purpose. I said very calmly. I am a teacher, and I have worked with students on house arrest for years, so temper tantrums are my daily routine, and nothing makes them angrier than a calm, rational response. Don't put your mitts on me, and I usually get two pounds wrapped separately, so my less than a pound order is nothing. I turn around, and she starts telling Entitled Daughter that I'm mean, and I'm taking Entitled Daughter's bacon. Entitled Daughter of course cried, and I swear a little bit of butcher's tolerance died then too, because he looked so sad. I order one flank steak. There were four left. She said, Oh look, now she's taking the best tube steak. It was flank, but whatever. I order four chicken breasts that I don't pick out, and that was rude apparently too, as was my request for three pounds of ground chuck in separate packages. The guy in front of me ordered three in six packages, but whatever then move from the counter. As I'm looking at the bits and ends they had prepackaged, I feel a bump on my cart. Entitled Daughter was trying to take my bacon out of my cart. Butcher sees her, as does the man in front of me. He was chuckling. He was paying, probably thinking, not my circus, not my monkeys. The butcher walks over from behind the counter and says very calmly, do not take items from other people. He was clearly more angry than I, so I say, I got this. Kid, it's not nice to take things from people. Entitled mom says, Don't talk to my girl like that. I was legitimately using my nice teacher voice. Butcher walks over to the cashier, who looks appalled and unsure what to do about this all, and says something. I then walk over and check out. Butcher PMs me later on another app. I go there often, and he's a friend of a friend. He said make sure I get the bacon, or he'll call the police. He waited until I left before telling Entitled Mom she is banned from the store and she won't be getting her order. She had to make do with whatever she got at the big chain stores, which according to my husband's photos, he went to get the week's milk and some veggies, was next to nothing. Don't be a jerk to small business owners, they'll ban you. Can't wait to see if I get that kid in my class one day. Entitled Dad sells my $1500 PC and charges me the extra money for a TV. Okay, so this happened a few months ago. Background. I've been saving up for years to get a PC that I really wanted for $2,000. However, I found one with all the specs that I wanted for $1,500 once I had earned the money. That also allowed me to get a nice monitor, keyboard, and mouse. I also got a new desk because my old one was falling apart. I'm 17 years old by the way. Anyway, in the end I had about $300 or $400 left in my bank account. However, my entitled parents, who created my bank account, also have the info to get into it. Anyways, I had all of the things for my PC sitting in the corner of my room while I waited for the desk to arrive. This is when Entitled Dad strikes. Entitled Dad. Hey OP. Me. Yeah? What is it? Entitled Dad. Correct me if I'm wrong, but what grades do you have right now? I think they look terrible. Me. I have almost all A's and one B. Why? I didn't raise you for a B. Look, it's almost a C already. It wasn't. Me. I've always had trouble in history. I don't see what the whole big deal you're making is. This was the wrong thing to say. How dare you? I raised you and you treat me like this? He then proceeded to kick me out of the house and say, Get out of here until you've learned your lesson. I just did what I normally would do whenever he gets moody. Take a walk to Starbucks and play games on my phone for a few hours. When I returned home, it was about 7 p.m. I went into my room to lay down when I noticed something wrong. My unopened boxes of things for my PC were all ruined. I thought he had destroyed it, but they were empty. He wasn't home either. I start to panic when I got a call from him. This is how the conversation went. Entitled Dad. I hope you're really happy with yourself. Me. 
What the heck did you do with my stuff? Oh, what do you mean? I'm just helping you to improve your grades. Me. No, you're not. You're just stealing my stuff. How dare you accuse your loving father of doing something like that? I would never steal from you. I just remove your privileges when you're bad. Me, now getting angry. What did you do with my computer? Entitled Dad. Oh, you won't be needing that old thing anymore. I sold it. He then hung up, and I can just imagine his smug face. Later on, when I manage to pull myself back together, my dad ends up pulling into the driveway. He's pulling a big box after himself. Entitled Dad. Help me out with this. Me. No, why should I do that? What you should do is give me the money you got for the computer. Entitled Dad. It wouldn't be a punishment if I just gave it back to you. In fact, you're not getting any back at all. I just spent it all buying this new TV for myself. By the way, you're grounded now, and I'm taking away your phone, and you can't watch TV for at least two months. This was just outrageous. He not only sold my computer, but he's using the money for his own self-benefit. He even sold the keyboard and mouse and would have gotten even more money for them if he hadn't taken them out of the box. After a few days, with me going to school and not coming back until late at night, ignoring my dad's yelling at me every night, I decided to just check in and see how my monthly interest was going in my bank account. To my horror, when I opened it up, there was only $15 left in it. I was sure I had at least $350, meaning Entitled Dad had done something. I confronted him about it and he just said, TVs cost more than you think. He bought an $1,800 TV and charged me what he couldn't make for my PC. The moment I get enough money, I'm out of here, and I bet he's going to be shocked when not just my sister, but I won't be showing up to his family gathering as well. Entitled Dad Demands Table on Christmas So this happened when I was 16. I'm almost 21 now. As the title said, this happened to me on Christmas. I worked as a hostess in a restaurant that was in a hotel that was part of a ski resort. A little confusing. Anyway, on Christmas Day, we were completely booked. Literally no space at all for any walk-ins and to-go orders would take at least an hour to make. As I'm just chilling at the host stand, waiting for the next guest to come in, the phone rings. I answer it with my usual greeting and I have this entitled dad on the other line. Since this happened years ago, this is a general idea of the conversation. Entitled Dad Yes, I'd like to make a reservation for six people tonight. Me. I'm so sorry, sir, but unfortunately, since it's Christmas night, we're booked solid and have no availability. However, I can do a to-go order, though it will take at least an hour to be ready. Ugh, let me talk to everyone. I'll call back. He hung up. I go on seating guests, and I even had my manager come to see if there was a way we could possibly fit the guy and his family in. There wasn't. A few moments later, the entitled dad calls back. I do my usual greeting, and he informs me who he is. What if we separated into two tables, like three and three, or two and four? Me. I'm sorry, sir, but as I told you before, we're completely booked for the night. I even had my manager look, and there's nothing we can do. I'm happy to get you a to-go order, though. This is outrageous. I have to talk to my family again. He hangs up. I go back to seating people, and eventually the entitled dad called back. Again, I greet him with my usual, and he tells me who he is. I suppose we'll do a to-go order. Great. It will be at least one hour before it's ready. However, if you leave a name and phone number, I'll be happy to call you when it's ready. An hour? This is ridiculous. Whatever. We'll have... He tells me his order. Me. All right. Your total will be this much, and I'll call you as soon as it's ready. You better. This is awful service. He hangs up. I go back to work and kind of forget about this guy. Eventually, his order is ready, and I call him to let him know. He answered and was very curt with me. When he showed up, he had a kid in tow, probably to help carry the food, who was about 10. I took his card, gave him the food, and everything seemed fine. Until, entitled dad. So, do you have a table for my family and I to eat this at? Me. I'm sorry, sir, but like I told you over the phone twice, we're completely booked for the night. You're just being a jerk. I was shocked he said this, since I was 16, just doing my job, and he had his kid with him. I just kind of stood there for a few seconds. Me. Uh, I'm sorry you feel that way, sir. Let me get my manager for you. I went to my manager's office and told him the whole story. He already knew part of it, as he had tried to help figure out a way to seat them earlier. My manager came out to the host stand with me where Entitled Dad and his kids were still waiting. Manager. Sir, my hostess told me what you said to her. 
I'm going to wish you a very Merry Christmas and request you not come back to our restaurant for the remainder of your stay. Happy Holidays. With that, the Entitled Dad just stood for a few seconds before walking away defeated. I never saw him again and I quit that place a few months later. I got a Karen to apologize. This happened a couple years ago and at the time I didn't know what a Karen was. Luckily, our paths crossed at an unnerving time for me, so I wasn't having any of her crap. I had to make my way to an appointment, but first I needed to stop by the postal annex to mail out important documents for my fiancé. As I was walking towards the door, I see this elderly woman trying to hold open the door while rolling in a dolly full of packages. I held open the door for her. At this point, I figured I would have to make myself comfortable standing in line because she has so many packages to mail out. As it turned out, she worked there. It was surprising to me because this woman couldn't be any younger than 70 years old, but she acted older. I chalked it up to the expense of living in the Bay Area. Unless you have a few dozen golden eggs that you're sitting on, there's no way you're going to retire. So given her age and demeanor, she worked at a very slow pace. No big deal. I already told myself to get comfortable standing in line. She was helping the woman in front of me when all of a sudden the Karen walks in. Middle-aged woman running around in yoga pants, one of those vest thingies you'd wear on a hike, big sunglasses, and medium-length, clearly dyed blonde hair thrown up in an I'm important ponytail. Everything she was wearing was very nice, so it's clear she had money. After all, this postal annex just happened to be in one of the richer cities in the Bay Area. I didn't think anything of her at first, but after about five minutes of her standing in line, she just bolts past me and goes straight to the counter. She tosses her package on the counter next to the woman who is still currently being helped and without saying, excuse me, she just starts telling the employee that she needs this mailed out. Here's the address. I'll be back in a bit to pay. Then she leaves without giving the employee the chance to decline. I was livid. How dare she interrupt another customer and then go on to treat the employee like a servant. However, there was nothing I could do about it. She was gone and I'd most likely be gone before she came back. The woman in front of me also happened to be much older in age, so between her and the employee, things were going slow. Not a problem, because I was too busy thinking about my appointment and worrying about what the doctor was going to say to me. First it was one tumor, now it was two, now it's four. Am I going to survive surgery? Do I have cancer? Will I be able to have kids after or do they have to remove my uterus? Some of the tumors had fused to other organs, will they be able to remove them without harm to anything else? I was having an internal meltdown. I didn't even notice that 10 more minutes had passed. Then it was finally my turn. I was about 2 minutes in when a man came strolling in. He went to the part of the counter that deals with receiving, from what I could tell. Since this woman was the only employee at the time, he would have to wait. He just propped himself against the counter and played with his phone. 5 more minutes have passed and I'm starting to realize it's getting close to my appointment time. I'm still being patient. The employee is having a hard time operating the computer system. She kept apologizing. It was clear she felt overwhelmed with using it. I told her no problem, take her time. Although not ideal, I could reschedule my appointment. I just didn't want her to feel rushed or like she's doing anything wrong. Whatever assurance I gave her flew out the window the moment Karen came back. She made her way to the line and blurted out, You still haven't gotten to my package? Okay, I was mad. What a jerk. Though I decided not to say anything unless she continued being a jerk. Of course she did. She started huffing constantly with a face of wine. After a couple minutes of her doing so, I had enough. I turned around and said, Look, we're moving as fast as we can. You need to be patient. I am actually in a rush and need to get to a very crucial doctor's appointment, yet I'm still standing here being patient. Be patient. Karen was a little taken back, but she still decided to speak. But I'm always patient. Me, in a calm yet strict tone, tossing a package at the employee, Telling her to mail it out so that you can leave, probably to rain heck on some other employee somewhere else? Come back and complain that she hasn't gotten to your package yet? And then huffing and puffing in line like a kid? Is not being patient. If you were always patient, we wouldn't be having this conversation now, would we? She looked like she got slapped in the face with a reality stick. She meekly said sorry and shut up the rest of the time we were waiting. After I had finished, I thanked the lady helping me turned to Karen and smiled and told her to have a good day. She said you too and good luck with your appointment. I thanked her and left. A part of me wanted to stay to make sure that the man at the end of the counter who had been patiently waiting was going to be served next, 
I really hope he was, and that Karen didn't pull that crap of, I was here first, even though she left and was gone for about 15 to 20 minutes. For the record, no cancer, safely removed all tumors, other organs just have a little scar tissue, and I was able to have a kid. Entitled mom flips out on me because I ordered a vegan meal, but added an egg to it. So, I'll start by saying I'm mostly vegan, but I occasionally indulge in an egg or some cheese at breakfast. This morning happened to be one of those occasions. Wasn't planned or anything. I went out to buy donuts for the factory. One of my guys is having his last day today, so I figured it would be nice if I bought everyone donuts to send him off. Next to our favorite donut joint, Daniel's Donuts in Springville, Victoria, Australia, if anyone's interested. Best donuts ever. Is a Hungry Jack's. That's Aussie Burger King for the rest of you. Don't know why they rebranded down here, but they did. Anyways, I hadn't had breakfast this morning and figured I'll pop in to Hungry Jack's for a vegan avocado muffin. Now those things are alright, but I was a little extra hungry and kinda in the mood for an egg, so I asked for the vegan avocado muffin with egg and a large meal, coke for the drink. It's at this point, a woman who had already ordered completely lost her mind. Should mention, she's an entitled mom, as she did have her kid with her, and the poor thing was quiet this whole time though. The woman went up to the counter and asked them what I had ordered. I was raised to mind my own business, so while I could overhear the conversation, I shut my mouth. Entitled mom. What did that tradie just order? Cashier. Vegan meal with egg. Entitled mom. Well, if it has egg, it can't be vegan. Change the order so there's no egg. Cashier. I can't do that, ma'am. He ordered what he wanted and paid extra for the egg. That's ridiculous. If I order a vegan burger with bacon, would you make it? Of course. But that's impossible. Bacon isn't vegan. This went on for a bit until I lost it and started laughing. You think this is funny? What the heck is wrong with you? Me. Nothing. I ordered a delicious meal and you're losing your mind. It's pretty funny. You're just a troll. I bet this whole thing was a joke, and you ordered this to upset me. Me. Lady, how would I have known it would upset you? Sorry, are you vegan or something? Do I look like a stinking hippie? No, I'm not a vegan, and neither are you. You're too fat to be vegan. I've heard this before. I haven't eaten meat in 26 years, since I was a little bigger. But I've been fat most of my life and have heard, you can't be vegan or vegetarian because you're too fat. Can I just please dispel that misconception? Just because you don't eat meat doesn't mean you eat healthy. Me. And yet, I am vegan, but I occasionally enjoy an egg. Even if I wasn't, I don't see how it's any of your business what I order and why. Maybe I'm not vegan, but just like the patty and avocado. Don't be stupid. You obviously did this to upset me. Change your order now. Me. Lady, I'm not changing anything, and you can buzz off if you don't like it. Entitled Mom. Kick him out of the store. Kick him out of the store. Now, there is no satisfying ending to this, except that my meal was ready, and I grabbed it. She reached out her hand to take it, but I was quicker than her, smiled at her and said, Bon appetit, before leaving. There was no store manager, no men in white coats to drag this jerk away kicking and screaming, and nobody to swoop in and save the kid. Just a crazy jerk who can't mind her own business, and me. A dude who encounters way too many crazies. Speaking of Burger King, what do you like more, Burger King or McDonald's? Please let me know. Karen in a restaurant demands a booth that is already taken. The couple sitting there refuses to leave. Chaos ensues. I saw a public freakout recently that reminded me of something that happened when I was a hostess in my early 20s at a steakhouse. A family of four came in, and when I set them, the mom, I'll call her Karen, wanted to move to an area where no tables were open. I told her she could wait back up front and we'd seat her when one of the tables opened. She insisted on standing right by the bus station so she had a view of the people sitting in her desired area. The four of them were in the way of guests and servers, but Karen did not notice. She was too busy staring daggers at people eating. I went to the manager, who tried to move her, but to no avail. Finally, we just let them stay because we noticed a couple in a booth packing up their food. I checked in a few minutes later to see if that table had left yet and was dismayed to see they had ordered dessert and coffee. Karen was still standing there watching them. The kids were bored and running up and down the wheelchair ramp. 
I asked Karen again to move back down to the waiting area as she was blocking servers and her kids were an accident waiting to happen. She loudly asked when her table would be ready and pointed right at the couple sipping their coffee. Knowing we were talking about them, the couple looked at us and smiled. It hit me then that they were not leaving on purpose. Oh no. Karen realized it as well because she got very angry. She yelled that they were holding her booth hostage and we should kick them out. I told her we would not ask anyone to leave until they were ready. Then I watched in horror as the woman approached the couple. Karen, you're done here. This is my table now. Pay the bill and go. Couple, smiling sweetly. We just got our coffee and dessert. Then take it to go. We are hungry and you're in our booth. Couple, this is our booth. It's not yours until we leave. Karen raged insults at them until the manager came rushing up to help. He tried to intervene, but could not be heard over the screaming about her starving kids. The couple kept their cool the whole time, nibbling their dessert and stirring their coffee at a sloth speed. Finally, the manager had enough and told the woman to get out. She was utterly floored that we were asking her to go and not the couple. She picked up an empty dessert plate from the table and chucked it across the room when it hit a wall and smashed into pieces. The manager screamed for someone to call 911. This was before everyone had cell phones. I remember trying to hide my smile from the people around me. What adult acts like this? This woman was in her 40s. There were a ton of open booths too, and just not in that area. Karen's husband appeared, grabbed her by the sleeve and started pulling. She let him lead her towards the front door as she continued to yell insults at us. She called the manager a loser and mocked his career choice. She told me I was a plain nothing going nowhere and worthless. And when they had gone, I went into the back for a while to hide. I needed to get away from people. When I returned, the server of the couple ran up to me. Server, that couple left, but they wanted to talk to you. They felt so bad about how that woman acted. They saw her watching them and she was being so rude, they decided to take their time to mess with her. They didn't think she'd do that. They waited a few minutes to talk to you, but they thought you went home and asked me to give you this as an apology. He handed me a $100 bill. It was a crappy night, but it kind of made me feel better. It's not every day a customer acknowledges when they've made your life miserable. Thankfully, Karen was never seen again. Edit. I say the couple made my life miserable because they were done eating and planning to leave, but they decided to stay and mess with the Karen. If they had just left, none of that would have happened. Nothing they did hurt me, but the insults from Karen sure did. It's not easy to be a young kid making $5 an hour and being berated by people who think they're better than you. Man demands refund for four bottles of wine while only returning one. Okay, so this happened just yesterday. Was too tired to write it up when I got home last night. It happened very fast and he was mumbling somewhat, so I'll have to paraphrase slightly. Cast. We've got me and we've got the irate customer. I'd only just started my shift when a man gets far closer to me than I'd like and asks if I'm the manager of the shop. I explained that while I wasn't the overall manager, I was the shift manager and asked if there was anything I could help him with. He tells me that he had bought four bottles of wine from the shop at the weekend, but the first three had been corked and undrinkable. He had called up our customer service line and they told him to bring them back for a replacement or a refund. Me, would you like them replaced or refunded? Customer, I'd like them refunded, please. So I asked him to follow me over to the tills so I can put through his refund. He produced a single unopened bottle from the bag he was holding and handed it over. Me, I'm sorry, but I can only issue refunds on the bottles you return. Do you have the others? Customer, I was told I'd get a full refund. Me. Yes, but I'm not authorized to issue a refund on an item that's not actually being returned. Even an empty bottle would do. Customer. Who am I? Me. I don't know who you are, sir. Customer. Who am I? Me. I don't understand what you're asking. Do I look like an idiot? No, sir. Then stop trying to treat me like one. I was told I would get a full refund. Me. And I can refund this bottle. I held up the one on the counter, but I'm not authorized to issue refunds on items that have not been returned. If you could come back tomorrow morning, the manager might be able to help you. No, she'd say exactly the same thing, but I honestly just wanted to get rid of him at this point. Customer, I was told I'd get a full refund. 
me. And as I've explained, I can't issue a refund for an item that hasn't been returned. Don't you get angry with me. Me, lowering voice slightly. I'm sorry if that's how I sound, but I'm just trying to explain that- What's your name? I'm going to call and complain. I took a piece of spare paper and carefully wrote out my name and handed it to him. He looked at it. Customer. Who am I? At this point, I was starting to wonder if he was actually asking what his name was and if he'd expected me to write it down so he wouldn't forget. <laughs> me. You're a customer. Do I look like an idiot? I had to stop myself from saying yes at this point. Me. No, sir. Would you like a refund on this bottle? He just grabbed the bottle and stormed out, glaring at me as he went. I wrote the incident up in my shop diary, just in case he did come back. Later that evening, the manager called on an unrelated issue and I took the opportunity to warn her in case she didn't see the diary. She agreed that I had done the right thing, saying that customer services would have called or emailed the shop in advance if he had actually contacted them. We agreed that he probably was just trying to get some money out of us by threatening to cause trouble. She also agreed that I'm not known for losing my cool when dealing with problem customers, so even if he did complain, she'd have my back. All in all, just another fun day in the world of retail. Fine, I'll take notes in your class. This story is from my AP US History class back in 2008. This was the very first ever AP History class at the school, and so it was a bit of a pilot program. The teacher, Mr. K, was a favorite of most students in the school, but as I would learn, always seemed to have trouble with one specific kid every year. Here is where I come in. I took the class, not because I needed it, but because I had a hole in my schedule and couldn't take another study period. I'm a big history buff and had a feeling it would be a breeze. It was. In his class, I never took notes. One, because I didn't need to. It was almost all stuff I already knew. Not a smart brag, should see me in math. Ugh. Two, I learn better as an active listener. When I take notes, I'm more focused on writing than learning. One day he says something off the cuff like, OP, am I boring you? Or do you think you know everything? He didn't expect me to answer with the latter, but it got a chuckle. Move on to a few days later, and he asks me to stay after class. Apparently, I was disrespecting him by not taking notes. I explained my situation. I'm on the debate team. I get a lot of practice and learning by listening, stuff like that. He huffs and tells me I need to take the class more seriously. It's worth noting, I had a perfect score in the class several weeks in. The next day I show up and do my usual thing, sit and listen, no notes. He tells me to go to the office and wait for him after class. A whole thing happened there and naturally the vice principal just says, is it that hard to just write some stuff down to make him happy? All right, yeah, I can do that. It's Friday, so I have the weekend to plan. I show up to his class on Monday and sit in the very front up against the side of the wall and hide my malicious compliance props beside the desk. The biggest memo pad the office supply store had, four feet by two and a half feet approximately, and a pin that I constructed that came out to be around four feet long as well. He starts the class, shoots me a dirty look, turns to write on the whiteboard. I whip him out and the entire class erupts in laughter. He turns to see me deadpan ready to take notes. OP, what the heck is that? It's my notepad, Mr. K. I'm ready to take this class seriously. What was that you were about to say about the invention of the assembly line? Got kicked out again. This time, talked to the principal. He laughed, asked if I thought I could pass the AP test without the class. I said yes, and I was pulled from the class permanently and given an extra study hour. For the record, I did pass the test. Also worth noting that this teacher had earlier accused me of plagiarism, which flew back in his face as well. Speaking of history class, what was your favorite class in school, besides study hall? Local politician claims, I don't know who I'm talking to, over a wooden pallet that he was technically stealing. <laughs> Happened a few hours ago as of this post. I'll try to keep it short and sweet. I work at a local retail drugstore that happens to sell wood pellet fuel. Not to be confused with pallets, the wooden thing they come on. I get tongue twisted over that all the time. In case you don't know, they're basically little compressed pellets of sawdust and wood particles that come in a 40 to 50 pound bag. At my store, we sell them in bulk and you can get a deal selling them by the ton. Naturally, we get entire pallets stacked to that number and wrapped in plastic. I happen to be going outside where the pallets are stacked to do two things. One, open a pallet that only had a single slit in it 
that was hard to pull single bags from. 2. Offer to help a guy who had just bought a ton to load them into his truck. The guy loading his truck tells me he is all good, just minding his own business, cut it open with his own pocket knife and everything. I don't need to check his receipt or anything because I witnessed the transaction minutes ago. I go to do the other task I listed above when I hear the sound of one of the wooden pallets landing in a truck bed. I connect A to B pretty quickly and I go ahead and remind him of the store policy that the pallets are not for sale. My exact words were, I'm sorry, I can't let you take the pallet. From this point, I don't remember the order of things that were said, so in lieu of script format, I'm gonna throw down a few quotes said by each party involved. Me, I'm sorry, I can't let you take the pallet. Sir, it's store policy. Who in the store actually told you you could take them? I'm just doing my job. Sir, I told you I'm just doing my job. Local politician. You have no idea who you're talking to. Somebody else already told me I can take it. I'm not going to stop now. Go on, call the cops, I dare you. Don't get smart just because you're in charge here. Go inside and do your job. He said that about three times. The exchange ended with me unfortunately going back inside, not accomplishing the goal of getting the pallet back. The store is hands off in terms of loss prevention policy. I asked a few fellow managers and supervisors if they had been letting people take pallets and they all said no. At that point, I decided the least I could do was change the sign on the display so that in no uncertain terms, people knew the pallets were store property and not allowed to be taken. Of course, I waited till after he was gone so as to not escalate the situation any further. I only learned afterward that he had a position in the town slash village government after the exchange was over. He looked vaguely similar to a guy that had caused a scene a few weeks back over an unrelated incident. I called one of the people involved to identify him on the camera and they happened to know right away. While he wasn't the person from the other incident, she knew who he was by name. When I heard the name, it clicked because I had read about it in the local newspaper before. His attitude made a little more sense now. Up until that point, the phrase, you have no idea who you're talking to, didn't mean much to me. The fellow employee in turn rationalized that I thought they were the same person because of how big-headed the people in both incidents were. Judging by her tone, this is not the first time he's tried to let his position get to his head. She confirmed to me that shouting at a retail store employee is not out of the ordinary for him. Interview with an entitled parent My boss was holding interviews for a new engineer yesterday. I'd been asked to sit in as I know more about the exact needs of the job. Very much not my normal role, but they needed someone to ask questions to tell if the interviewees could do the job. Anyway, towards the end of the day, one guy comes in. He seems to know his stuff, and the boss is going through the usual spiel. One of the questions was, tell us about a time you stood up to adversity. This interviewee talks about this time he had promised his son a special gift if his son did well on a test. His son loved music, so dad decided to buy him a guitar. He went out, saw a good second-hand one, offered to buy it, but the guy refused to sell it to him because of his nationality. He goes on telling how he insisted, how he offered a fair price, and eventually the police got involved. He eventually got the guitar, and his son loved it. My boss asks a few questions. So, a shop refused to sell you something? Guy. Oh, it wasn't a shop. Boss. You were ordering online? Guy. No, I just found this person in a park. Boss. Selling a guitar? Playing it, but I gave them a fair price. This goes on for a while. My boss gradually teasing out the story. He said later he thought something was off about this guy. This man had decided they needed the guitar of some random teenager in a park. He had offered a fair price, which the teen had refused, and then he basically stole the thing, throwing some money at him and walking off with the instrument. Cops got called, entitled parent claimed to have bought it, teen said the interviewee had stolen the instrument. The guy then simply walked off with the guitar while the police were taking the statement from the teen. Apparently, his son was very happy with the guitar. Guy was proud of what he had done and convinced he had gone above and beyond for his kid and that he had done the right thing stealing a guitar. Needless to say, Guy did not get the job. My boss has also contacted the agency that referred the interviewee to blacklist him. Entitled Mom Tries to Steal My Wedding Money We've got me, my fiancé, entitled mom, bank employee, and bank manager. Me and my fiancé are getting married in December. We both set up a joint savings account, and with a great deal of working our butts off, we were able to save up about $10,000 for the wedding of our dreams and our honeymoon and anything else we'd need down the line. 
Now, a while back, I agreed to have a cup of coffee with my horrible entitled mom, the one who was a total jerk and walked out on us 11 years ago. The only reason I agreed to meet with her was because I promised my little sister I'd try and be nice and hear her out. Anyway, we spoke. Well, she spoke and I just glared at her and then we left. She then begged me for a lift back to the station and I begrudgingly agreed. I dropped her off and hoped I'd never see her again. Until today. We were sitting at home watching a movie when my phone rings. It's the bank. Bank employee. Hello, this is bank employee calling from Santander. Am I speaking to OP? Me. Yes, hi, uh, can I help you? Bank employee. I need to discuss account sensitive information. Can you just confirm some security details for me? I answer his questions and then ask what is going on. Employee. Your fiance is sitting in our waiting area. She's requesting that we transfer 7,000 from your joint account into an account in a different name. Obviously, this raises some flags, and as per your security settings, any transfer over 1,000 requires joint authorization. We did. Hang on. Sorry, I've just been told she's left the branch, although we still have the card. Me. Let me stop you right there. We're coming in now. Whoever just tried to transfer money from my account wasn't my fiance, as she's sitting right next to me. I'll be there in 20 minutes. Employee. Okay, we do have to notify our fraud office of this incident. I'll see you soon. Me and fiance get to the branch and ask to speak with employee and he walks over. Employee. Hello, we just spoke on the phone, didn't we? Me. Yes, hopefully you can tell me how someone got access to our account. Certainly. First things first, if I may see some ID, I can give you your card back. Me. Sure thing. We both hand over our driver's licenses. He looks at them and then hands it back, along with the card. Fiance. Can you describe the woman who tried to gain access? Me. Actually, you could do one better. I showed my warrant card and badge to bank employee. Me. Police. Would you mind getting your manager? I'd love to have a look at the CCTV from the time of the access. Employee. This is quite irregular, but I'll go get my manager. Ultimately, it's her choice should she show you the footage. Employee picks up a phone off the desk and places a call. A few minutes later, a smartly dressed woman in a burgundy suit walks out. She's holding a laptop. As she walks up, she extends her hand and I shake it. Manager. Officer, if I may just check your ID, I can show you a CCTV still image, but I'm afraid actual video footage would need to be requested via head office. Fiance. That's all right, isn't it? We just want to know who it is. Me. Yeah, we do. I once again show my ID. The woman opens her laptop and turns the screen around, and there in glorious 1080p is a photo of my mother leaning against the counter. Fiance. Wait, isn't that... Me. Yeah, it is. I turn to bank manager and bank employee. Me. Thank you very much. I know who the woman in this picture is. It's my mother. She's unwell. Please proceed with contacting the fraud office and I'll deal with her. Thank you so much for your time. We leave the branch and I take my phone out and dial my mom's number. She answers almost immediately. Entitled mom. Hello son, what a lovely surprise. Me. Cut the crap. I know you tried to get into my and fiance's bank account. So before I block your number and say to it that you get arrested for theft and bank fraud, I just wanted to say that I knew you'd never change. You're still the same vile, horrible person you've always been. Entitled mom. Listen here, you ungrateful man. I deserve that money. It's a son's duty to help their mother out. You owe me. Plus, it's not like you need it. Now, me on the other hand, I happen to need... Click. I end the call and push the block number button. As it turns out, my mom took the card from the glove compartment of my car when I was dropping her off at the station. And yes, don't worry, both me and fiancé will be filing charges against her. Also, another thing that bothered us... What the heck did she need 7,000 pounds for? Pastor lies, cheats, and steals. He gets exactly what he deserves. The cast. We've got Pastor Bob, not his real name. We've got the contractor. And we've got me. I have been a computer technician for more than 15 years. I have worked on all kinds of computers, everything from tiny point-of-sale computers to large rack server computers. I had been attending a new-to-me church, I was trying to date a woman there, this church was her idea. That relationship crashed and burned, but that's a different story. Now we can start. It was about five years ago. 
I had just sat through a long sermon about generosity and giving to those that need help. At the end of the sermon, Pastor Bob asked for an additional donation because the church's roof needed repairs and it would cost 20,000 US dollars. That's right, 20,000 freedom dollars for a new roof. After the service, I'm talking to my date. Pastor Bob walks over to me. I say hi and he introduced himself and we talked for a bit. Pastor Bob asked what I do for a living. I tell him I'm a computer tech with a shop. As I'm telling him, I have a feeling he already knows what I do. Pastor Bob asks me to have a look at his laptop. It's being very slow, so I agree. I turn the laptop on and I hear a clicking noise. This clues me in, it's probably the hard drive, but I can still access the data. This is a good thing, it means I can probably recover the data. So I tell Pastor Bob the hard drive is dying and it needs to be replaced. I also tell him I can probably recover the data. Pastor Bob asked how much it would cost to fix. I tell him for most people I would charge around $250. However, I feel I can donate my time, so I would just need $60 for a new hard drive. Pastor Bob agrees, so I write up an invoice. New hard drive, $60. Labor, zero. Data recovery, zero. And two to four days for repair. Pastor Bob signed the invoice, so I take the laptop to my shop. I open the laptop. HP, why do you use so many screws and clips? I get the hard drive out and connect it to my recovery rig. I set up the recovery to clone the data to a new hard drive, but not the new one for the laptop, a high-end storage drive. I go home after locking up the shop. Next day, Monday, I open the shop and check the recovery rig. It's working, but it will take at least 10 more hours. So I start work on the other tickets. Then at closing time, I lock up and go home. Next day, Tuesday, I've had Pastor Bob's laptop for two days. I open the shop and check my recovery rig. Good news, recovery completed 100% data recovered. Report says hard drive developed too many bad sectors. Now I have a choice to make. I could put a one terabyte hard drive, $60, or a 120 gigabyte solid state drive, $60. Or I could pay some money myself for a 240 gigabyte solid state drive, $100. I decide why not and put the 240 gigabyte solid state drive in the laptop. I then clone all the data over from the new recovery storage drive to the new 240 gigabyte drive. An hour later, the clone is done. So I check everything and the laptop works great and is exactly like how it was before the first hard drive had failed. Even the login still worked. So I call Pastor Bob and tell him his computer is done. He says that's great, he will be here soon to get it. About 45 minutes later, Pastor Bob walks in. I show him his laptop working and it's much faster. He loves it, signs the pickup form. He then pays me with a check for $60. It's important he paid with a check. I do a bank run on Monday and Friday. So that Friday, I'm at the bank. I'm informed that Pastor Bob's check is void. What? Why? Pastor Bob had placed a stop payment on the check. So I call him and he ignored my call. I go to church on Sunday. Pastor Bob gives a sermon about not lying. I walk up to him and he avoids me. So I leave and decide I'm going to write it off. I spent $100 and some time to do something nice. A few weeks later, a customer walks in looking for a new computer. So I offer him a drink and go over his options. I'm chatting him up and he tells me he's a contractor and he mostly does siding and roofing. He's thinking about offering solar and that's why he's getting a new computer. I ask how much does a new roof cost he says up to about $10,000. So I ask him, why would someone say $20,000? He had no idea. I thought it was strange. I asked about the church. Contractor said it would have been simple and around $5,000 and he could probably do it for less. Contractor buys nice new laptop. Sorry the setup took so long. The revenge starts now. Something about what the contractor said bugs me later. Why would Pastor Bob lie and say $20,000 for a new roof? And why would he stiff me for $60? I then remember I never cleared the recovery rig storage drive. So I check and there it is, Pastor Bob's laptop data. I look around, it's slow and I'm all caught up on repair tickets. So I decided I'm going to clone Pastor Bob's data to a second laptop. I look around a bit. He had all of his logins stored in a folder on the desktop, including his online dating logins and online poker. Did I ever mention Pastor Bob is married? I start printing his online dating messages. I look back and find Pastor Bob had been meeting several women from his online dating. He had been paying for his dates from the church's donation fund. I am getting angry now. 
Then I realized he had met up with the woman I was dating when I was dating her. It was then I decided to break Pastor Bob. I printed out all his dating messages for the last six months, except I refused to print the pics. It was an impressive packet. I then decide I need copies of the packet, so I ordered 100 packets printed from a major online printer. A few days later, my order of revenge packets arrived. These revenge packets are amazing, double-sided, staple-bound, with a cover with Pastor Bob's face on it. Now the conclusion, and I think it's worth it. This church had a calendar of what the sermon might be about, and a perfect Sunday was approaching. I go to church that perfect Sunday. I show up a bit late. Everyone is in the church, so I put a revenge packet on each car. I have a few revenge packets that are in yellow envelopes, so I put them in the mail. I sent one to all the high ups in the church, and I sent a special packet with some of Pastor Bob's pics to his wife. I sent the return address to the church. I also emailed a bunch of people the revenge packet from a burner email. A couple weeks after that, I went back to that church. Pastor Bob was gone and so was his wife. Several of the women were also gone, including the one I was dating. I asked one of the important people there what happened. The answer was amazing. I was told about the revenge packet and how everyone had gotten one. The day my revenge packet appeared, the sermon Pastor Bob had given was about the evils of cheating. Thank you, church calendar. The fallout. Pastor Bob was fired and shunned. Multiple women from the church have not returned, including the one I was dating. Pastor Bob's wife is divorcing him, and she is the one that owned the house and cars. Pastor Bob is now being sued by several people, including the one that fixed the roof. He never paid any of them. There were also rumors of a criminal case for embezzlement. No one has seen Bob in a while now. The church might close if they can't find a new pastor, but the church's money is very low. Apparently, he also spent over $30,000 in online gambling. Old lady on airplane refuses to take her feet off of me. Sorry if things are a little choppy. This happened when I was 11. I'm 17 now, and the only other person there was my mom. She filled me in on the parts I had forgotten. Characters. We've got me. We've got my mom. Not entitled. We've got nice flight attendant. We've got the nice son who is in his mid-30s. We've got the nice son's wife, also mid-30s, and entitled parent, late 60s, early 70s. So this all happened when I was coming back from Miami with my mom on an airplane. We were flying back to San Francisco after a wonderful vacation to Disney World. My mom had planned the trip a little late, so we were not sitting together on the flight, but she was across the aisle and two rows back from me so I could see her. Now to set the scene, I was sitting in the aisle because I like to stretch my leg out every once in a while, and this old woman who looked as pale as a ghost, and she looked honestly like a female version of the Stacy Puff Marshmallow Man. She was sitting in the window seat, and her son and his wife were sitting in front of us. So anyone who has flown from Miami to San Francisco will know it's around 5-6 to six hours long. As soon as we take off, this woman takes off her shoes and puts her back to the wall and puts her legs on the middle seat. No one was there. Now this really disgusted me because her feet reeked and to top it all off, she had put her feet against my leg. I was silently freaking out because being 11, I had absolutely zero idea what to do. I didn't want to ask her to move because I thought that would be rude. My mom always told me to be nice to people and not point out things that grossed me out. So internally, I was screaming. About 20 minutes into the flight, the flight attendant started coming around asking what drinks people wanted and if they wanted one of those little portable TVs they have on planes. When she asks what drink I would like, I look at her and just point it at the lady's feet. The following conversation ensues. Nice flight attendant. Ma'am, please put your feet down. Entitled parent. Oh, I'm sorry. I just need to keep them elevated until my Advil kicks in. You see, my back hurts sometimes when I fly, and I just need to stop the pain. Flight attendant. Ma'am, if this was going to be an issue, you should have taken them earlier or have gotten your own row. Now please take your feet off of him. I can't. The pain is unbearable. Mom, from the other row, stands up and walks over. What's the problem over here? She then noticed the lady's feet. Excuse me, please get your feet off of him. At this point, I just froze and didn't say anything because I don't like confrontation. Entitled parent. If he had a problem with it, then he should have said something. It's not my fault that I have so much back pain. Honestly, probably is her fault because she was super heavy. Not that there is anything wrong with that. Her son finally chimes in from in front of us because our conversation had woken him up. Nice son. 
Mom, just get your feet off of him. This is why we don't like flying with you. You always make a scene. Entitled parent. But my back hurts. Nice son. You took four Advils, and I know for a fact that your back doesn't hurt that badly. You did this on the flight here, and once you get on the plane, you magically have back pain. But, but... Mom, just stop. Nice son to me. Hey bud, do you want me to switch seats with you? I would be more than willing to give you my aisle seat. I said okay, and we traded seats. My mom thanked the nice son, and that was the end of it. The flight attendant gave me an extra Stroopwafel because I went through that. I thanked her for that, because now I love Stroopwafels. Once we get off of the plane and we went to get our luggage from the carousel, my mom and I saw Entitled Parent, Nice Son, and Nice Son's wife arguing about something, and I swear I heard Nice Son say something about how this was the last trip they were taking with Entitled Parent. I do feel bad if she was truly in pain, but if she knew it was going to happen, then she should have done something beforehand. I have to show up at 8.30 no matter what the schedule says? You got it. I was working for a daycare center while I was in college. We staggered staff in and staggered them out so that we were always fully staffed when all the kids were there and they all had various arrival and leaving times. So staff could be scheduled to arrive anytime between 7.30 a.m. and 2 p.m. I worked Monday through Friday, 8.30 to 4.30. Even though my schedule was fairly permanent, I would check the schedule that got sent out every Sunday evening. It would always get sent between 6 and 9 p.m and it would be for that current week, so we had less than 24 hours notice for our weekly schedule. A hot mess express if you ask me, but I'm not in charge and my schedule is set, so I don't raise too much fuss about it. One week I get the schedule, and it says that my arrival time is 9am instead of my usual 8.30 for the entire week. I figure they're just trying to make minor cuts, and they really like having everyone under the full time threshold, so I just assumed they were barely cutting my hours so they could get away with it. No big deal. But I knew that most of the kids arrived at 9, so I would need more time to set up. I get there at 8.45 on Monday and set up quickly and go about my day. I do a little prep Monday night so I don't have as much to prep in the morning. So on Tuesday, I get there at 8.55, clock in and begin my day. My week goes on like that with me prepping in the evening and getting there at 8.55 until Thursday when my boss calls me into the office and reprimands me for my tardiness. I tell her the schedule tells me that my arrival time is 9, so I'm actually arriving early every day. She says that the schedule says 9 just to indicate that you are the morning shift, but if you're scheduled for classroom time, you need to arrive at 8.30 regardless of what the schedule says, so you have time to set up the classroom. I don't agree with this at all, and it's obviously not true, because not everyone arrives at 8.30. Anyway, there has to be more distinction than just morning crew versus afternoon crew on the schedule but she admits that she's partially to blame for the mix-up and doesn't turn it into a formal write-off. I start arriving at 8.30 every morning, just like I had been before the week in question. I'm not a late person. One week, I was going to be scheduled for the 1 to 6.30 shift because another coworker needed to switch with me and we had both agreed to this. So the schedule comes out and says my arrival time is 1 p.m. I arrive at exactly 8.30, clock in, and sit my pretty butt in the office chair and wait. Well, eventually my boss notices that I'm just hanging out in the office and asks what I'm doing. I say, well, I was told to arrive promptly at 8.30 no matter what the schedule says, so here I am. She says, we don't need you here for the morning, so you can clock out and come back when your shift begins. Um, nope, I say. You can find a task for me to do until my shift at 1 starts, or I can sit here, but I'm staying clocked in. You were the one that said I have to be here at 8.30 no matter what. I'm just following your instructions. I had to deep clean the entire school until my shift actually started, but it was so worth it because I still got paid for the whole day and my boss had to admit to me that she was full of it. Watching her try to backtrack was the funniest thing that's ever happened to me. You want candy stocked? Okay then. A few years ago, I was working at a fabric store. One of my favorite places to be, but there was one manager that I didn't get on with. Not sure why, but this manager had some sort of problem with me. Since day one, the main boss would put me somewhere in the store and this other one would come in, counter the big boss's orders, and then spend the rest of the shift coming up to me and telling me to stock the candy every five minutes. And I do mean every five minutes. Ordinarily, this takes about three minutes and it's just basic busy work to do between customers. Not this time. So it's the day of darkness in the retail world, more commonly known as Black Friday. Not only are we slammed, 
but we also have to upsell this new promotional item. We were literally getting marks against us if we didn't sell a certain number that day. The lines were long and it was just one customer after another with no lull between. By the end of the sales time, every shelf was empty. Now, I am by no means perfect, but I try to make sure I do all of what my job entails. Part of the cashier's job was keeping the front shelf stocked and everything for that was behind the counter. There was nothing in the mythical back room and even if there was, the Xmas stuff had started coming in and for some reason this manager thought the best way to store it would be to put it in the direct middle of the hallway that was the back room and effectively block all of the regular merchandise. There was about two feet of aisle to walk down one side of the room, but that's it. Not relevant, but annoying. So the other cashier and I had cleaned up everything, restocked the shelves, and there was nothing left up front but one box of wafers and seasonal soaps. The candy was decimated, but there was nothing to put there. So we both chalked it up to a job well done, but we weren't allowed to leave the register that day. It had slowed down considerably, and we both had about two hours of shift left. So we were just talking, attending to the few customers that still trickled through and generally attempting to wind down from the insanity. So of course, this manager comes through and tells me specifically to stock candy. I try to explain that there isn't any back stock and she waves me off and repeats to stock candy. I spend a few minutes double checking that there isn't more stock, but no, it hasn't magically reproduced behind the counter. Okay, guess it's stocked. Apparently not as the manager comes back a few minutes later and tells me to stock it again. My coworker tries to explain and gets cut off with a temp. You need to stock it. I want those shelves full. Don't stop until they are. Okay, sure, full shelves. Now this has been months of her generally trying to get me to do most of the work in the store. This manager was having me do a lot of her own work, double if she found out I was having a health issue and I was tired of it. My doctor was already telling me I had to leave for my own health so I wasn't feeling generous. Told my coworker what I was going to do and she backed me up. I stocked those shelves. These tiny little candy shelves were stocked full of anything I could find behind the counter. Those wafers, soaps, various items from the promo shelves. I even fit a couple of steam irons on the top ones. Apologized to customers for the wait because I couldn't stop until those shelves were full. The manager came up, red in the face, and was ready to start yelling, but I was saved by the fact that there were customers there at the time. I checked my watch, grinned, waved, and my coworker and I walked to the back and clocked out. I never went back. Shopped there a few times since, and that manager is gone. Give me $2,000. So I was going to college, commuting, so I was driving back and forth, and working. I pulled out a loan to help pay for it and mistakenly thought I was getting $5,000. Please roast me for my naivete. I mistakenly told my mom, and she asked me if she could have $2,000 of it. I was happy too, at first. She didn't have a vehicle. She's gotten into wrecks in the past and genuinely felt bad for her. We didn't have a vehicle all throughout high school and for the most part, apart from the year my dad didn't have a job and stopped paying child support, we could have gotten one if we had saved up all that time, but my mom is really bad with money. I love my mom and wanted to help out. I thought I would be selfish if I didn't. So I told my boss, really proud of myself for being so unselfish, and she basically told me I was an idiot. She told me that I needed to keep that money for myself and buy myself a vehicle or put it towards college. I thought about it and kind of realized she was right. My mom, although I do love her, would give my brother her money and then ask me to cover it. They would buy a bunch of stuff they didn't need and then ask me for money to pay the bills. I didn't mind at first because I thought it was better to be unselfish. Finally, I got fed up with it and her, so I told her I was keeping the money. For the next month, she proceeded to harass me about how much she needed the money, threatened to kick me out, tell me to go live with my father, and guilt trip me constantly. She even got my brother in on it and he would tell me I was a selfish jerk. I still live with my mom and I'm trying to get out because it's hard to live with her sometimes. Any advice? And I'm sorry for the depressing post. Edit. I'm sorry, I should have mentioned this happened years ago, but it hasn't stopped. They continuously spend money they can't and ask me to cover it. They would hit me up while I was at college for money. My mom would also give money to my brother. He likes to act like a jerk, treat my mother like crap, and then when I get into arguments with my mother, suddenly he's mummy's little boy. My mother will let him get away with anything. He's gotten arrested several times and put our vehicle in a creek. Karen at Ski Resort snaps at me for asking her to look after her kid. So, this happened about a month ago. 
I was on a skiing holiday with my parents and everything was fine until that one day. It was nice and sunny, so the slopes were crowded and skiing normally was almost impossible. There was no room, a lot of beginners, and as always, the ones who just thought they could ski but actually couldn't. Back in the day, about 30 years ago, my mom hurt her knee really badly while skiing and has since been really scared she could get hurt again. Therefore, she mostly goes really slow and on the side of the slope. The slope where we were was partially closed due to the warmth, so you had to ski around the closed part. Now, the closed part was not prepared at all, so it was basically just a snowy ledge. Enter Entitled Mom and her kids. My mom stopped at the ledge to avoid the crowd, but she couldn't go around it right then because there were just too many people skiing too fast, and along came Entitled Mom with her kids skiing in front of her. One was about 13, but could barely stop next to my mom, like really close to her, about half a meter maybe. The other one was about five and was still learning. He could not stop. He ran straight into my mom, almost causing himself and her to fall down the ledge. So mom got really scared and skied away, so I decided to talk to them. The conversation went something like this. We've got entitled mom, we've got the older brother, and we've got the dad. Me to the older brother. Excuse me, I saw that your brother was having trouble stopping, so could you maybe look a bit more after him? I think it would be better if he'd ski between your parents so it's safer for him. Older brother. Yeah, sure, I'm sorry. Me. Okay, great. Thank entitled mom. What's going on? Older brother. Oh, she was just asking us to let little brother ski in between you and dad. Entitled mom. And who are you? Me. I saw that your kid had trouble stopping and ran into my mom, and they all mo- So what? He's still learning. Your mom could handle it. Me. I know that he's learning, but it's really dangerous with this many people around. He and my mom could have fallen off the ledge. Maybe you should go on another slope. It would be much safer. Yeah? Why don't you go to a different slope then, if your mom is scared of kids? Me. Ma'am, this slope up here is black. We have three colors, blue, red, and black. Blue being the easiest, and black being really steep and only for advanced skiers. And I don't think it's safe to ski here with your kid if you say he's still learning and you just let him run around here all alone. Who are you to talk? You're just a kid. You don't know anything. I'm 19 and have been skiing since I was three. You probably can't even ski yourself and just want to brag with your rental equipment. Having your own skiing equipment is kind of a status symbol for those rich people who go skiing once a year and travel to the most expensive resorts just to sit in the cabin all day. I don't have rental equipment as we go skiing a lot in winter and I'm more comfortable using my own stuff instead of getting used to new equipment every time. The dad. Honey, just leave it alone, please. Me to the older brother. Just look a bit more after him, please. I don't want him to get hurt. Brother. We will. Me. Okay then. Bye. Entitled mom. Bye. After that, I caught up with my parents and I told them the story. They just shook their heads. I hope the kid is fine and didn't get hurt that day, but I've seen it so often. The little ones get run into by those idiots who disregard the rules and just have to ski super fast, even though they're not that great of a skier and can barely keep their skis from slipping away. Have you ever been skiing? If not, is it something you'd like to try at some point? Please let me know. My spoiled cousin and his entitled parents ruined my birthday. We've got spoiled cousin who's four years younger than myself. I kind of grew up with him and he was six when this happened. We've got the entitled parents of my cousin, my entitled uncle from my mom's side and his wife. And we've got me. I was celebrating my 10th birthday. I know this event taken as a one-time thing doesn't look so bad, but for me, it wasn't a one-time thing. All my birthdays and other family gatherings were sort of like this after cousin was born. He was spoiled specifically by my maternal grandmother and obviously his entitled parents because he was the first male to be born and he was four years younger than me. For a little bit of context, to summarize things as the dynamics in my family are quite complex, let's just say the rules he had to follow were completely opposed to the rules I had to follow in terms of severity and responsibility just for being four years older than him and whatever he did was either not so bad or absolutely fantastic where what I did was a disaster or simply not good enough. That distinction in the appreciation of our actions is from the fact that he's a boy and I'm a girl. 
Now, this specific birthday was the only one where I showed I couldn't stand my spoiled cousin's behavior and his entitled parents anymore. So, back to the story. Well, this was an important birthday to me. First, I was going from a one-digit age to a two-digit age, and I was very excited about this. Second, as a present from my parents, I was getting my very first big girl bike, which I chose with them a few weeks before, and I was pretty excited about that too. I was so impatient to try it in the garden that my birthday wasn't coming fast enough for me. On one weekend day in the summer, everybody gathered at my parents' house. My grandparents, spoiled cousin, and his entitled parents, my aunt from my mother's side, and the daughter of our direct neighbors, who was an older friend of mine, and everything was going great. I was, like always when I was with spoiled cousin, babysitting him while the adults were doing their things because, yep, each time spoiled cousin was with me, he became completely my sole responsibility and whatever he would do, I've always been punished in one way or another for his mistakes, even if I tried my best to avoid him making them. But no one ever bothered to explain to him why what he did was wrong or hurtful. By that time, I was completely used to that kind of dynamics and that day, I was okay with it and I really did everything I could to be good with everyone fearing I wouldn't get my present if things turned badly. Even though I already knew that I would have to clean the prodigious mess my spoiled cousin made while playing in my room, that was also part of his spoiled behavior, losing or breaking things, making a mess, but absolutely never having to apologize for absolutely anything. His entitled parents never replaced the things he broke either or apologized for him. At some point, my mom called us because it was time for the cake, meaning that a little bit later I would finally get to ride my new bike. So I run and sat down at the table, very happy and ready for the traditional blowing candles picture. But while I was taking my breath, smiling, suddenly my spoiled cousin began to cry and mumbled things to the ear of the entitled parent who was holding him. One of the entitled parents, I don't remember who, got to me and asked if it was okay for my spoiled cousin to blow the candle first. I wasn't expecting that and asked why. I was simply answering something like, Oh, spoiled cousin just wants to, he's little, you know? To which I replied, But that's my birthday. I've never blown his candle at his birthday. I never would have dared to ask something like that. And that's when spoiled cousin decided to throw a tantrum to blow the candles off of my birthday cake. I was enraged and hurt and decided to just leave the table to go cry in the security of my room. My parents seemed to understand what was going on but couldn't do anything for me because of the entitled parents and the disapproving look my maternal grandmother gave to my mother and she knew it would have turned the party into a big and awful argument. The entitled parents seemed to be astonished by my sudden rebellion, totally disapproving my behavior but didn't say anything. At that point, I just wanted to withdraw myself from the all event, kind of, yeah, once again, just take whatever you want from me. But after a while, my father, understanding and reassuring, took me out of my now messy room to blow those candles I didn't want to blow anymore. And as it was for the greater good, I complied, even though my spoiled cousin was still going to blow the candles first. A picture I still have was taken when I got to blow the candles and all you can see is a sad and broken girl now forced to celebrate her 10th birthday with people who, for a good proportion, don't even care about the well-being of her as long as spoiled kid was happy. Sadly, the story doesn't end there, as my spoiled cousin also required, a little bit later, to ride my new bike first, even though his feet didn't touch the pedals and someone had to hold him on the bike. But I didn't care anymore. I didn't want to ride that bike either, as it was not really mine now, like the whole birthday party. I literally let everybody ride on that bike before me, as some of the family members gathered there were actively trying to cheer me up by being goofy. And at some point, it worked, and I finally got, in the beginning of the evening, my first ride. Old couple eats all of their food and refuses to pay. Two years ago, I worked at a hotel that was so isolated from the community, only old people went there. So this couple were international guests and had that, our country is richer than yours, and I'm better than you because you're a waiter attitude going on, annoyed me to no end. Our hotel had a special menu every day from a different country, so we basically had seven boards at the back with those menus. Tuesdays were Indian food. One Tuesday evening, the couple comes in and they are seated in my section. They order the special and I inform them that it will be a bit longer because I also had a table of 12 that ordered the exact same thing, not to mention other sections. They say it's fine, they will wait. 
awesome. Their food gets to them and they eat everything. Of course, I popped in and asked if their meal was fine. They say the food is perfect. I'm happy to hear that. After the main meal, I clear up their table and ask them if they want the dessert menu. They say yes and I bring it to them. They finish up and I ask them if they want any tea. They say no and ask for the bill. I leave them my pen because I assume they are just going to charge it to their room. A minute later, I come back to ask if they need a card machine and all that. That's where it got amusing for some of us. The missus decides to take charge and tells me that they will not be paying for the mains because the pieces of meat in the soup were too big for the soup and only four pieces in the bowl and really spicy. What? I ask what they mean and they repeat the very same thing. I tell them I can't do anything about it now because they already ate all the evidence and told me that everything was fine throughout the whole dinner. They say that's not true and that they will not be paying. So naturally, I go and inform duty supervisor, who is my hero, because this woman doesn't take crap from anyone. After 20 minutes of arguing, they take their things and leave. My hero takes a card machine and follows them. I laugh and continue on because I still had tables and I also had to clear up theirs and reset it. Not even 5 minutes later, my hero walks in with a receipt that not only shows that the bill was paid in full, but a 20% tip was also charged. They never tried to pull anything else for the rest of their stay. You want your club sandwich to stay together? You got it. This happened about 4 years or so ago. I used to work as a cook at a dine-in restaurant of a truck stop. The lack of leadership by the restaurant management bred an atmosphere of being able to get away with just about anything among the employees, including how we interacted with the customers. My coworkers quickly learned I preferred to work than gossip and they even more quickly regretted the rare time or two they would try to get me involved in some drama. As most of them didn't like my sarcastic wit, they would let me be. I pretty much was back in the kitchen most of the time and didn't have to usually deal with our guests, but would be out front from time to time, usually on my way to or from the restroom, and did get to know many of our regulars. There were all kinds of truck drivers, the ones who were cool and fun to talk with, the flirts, every once in a while an occasional creep who had to be dealt with. All walks of life of drivers graced our establishment and for the most part, no problems. Then there would be the drivers who, no matter what you did, were just outright jerks, rude to the staff, complaining about everything, and I mean everything. The weather, the repair shop, the music playing on the intercom, the showers, the price of diesel, the cost of items in the store, which was a separate department from the restaurant, the truck parking, all things that we had absolutely no control over, and hey guys, we're just here to serve you food, okay? Yeah, it would get a little tedious listening to the whiners, so whenever I happened to spot the few habitual verbal offenders sitting out front, I would take the way back around to the ladies' room. Like I said, I don't care for gossip or drama. So I'm working the grill line. It's a somewhat slow afternoon being middle of the week. The front counter is about half full with drivers sitting around chatting and eating when one of our regular jerks comes in. Now this particular regular jerk was a special breed, the kind I refer to as not happy unless they are watching the world burn. This guy took being a jerk to the next level, never wanted to socialize with the other drivers, never tipped the servers, always got his food to go. Yes, he would every single time open the container to inspect his order, grumble and make a snide comment. Would get the same thing every time, a club sandwich with fries, and for whatever reason, he would stick his head around the corner of the server line to see who was cooking before ordering, even though he would get the same thing every single time. Out of the corner of my eye, I see this driver peeking at me for a moment before he disappears from sight. Knowing what is coming, I go ahead and start the order. Now the club sandwich that we made was of the triple decker variety. Three slices of bread, ham, turkey, bacon, mayo, lettuce, tomato, and cheese, which upon assembly was held together with frill picks, very long toothpicks with colored plastic frills on one end, and cut into quarters. Sure enough, the ticket pops up on my printer a couple minutes later. As I had gotten a head start, the sandwich is already laid out on my cutting board and I'm waiting on the bacon and fries to finish cooking. I set up the to-go box and reach for the pan with the frill pigs, only to discover that there are none. No surprise, honestly. The other cooks aren't exactly known for keeping up with the line stocking, so I go over to the storage room to get some. We are out, completely. There isn't one single frill pick in the place. Oh crap, goes through my mind. 
Walking back to the line, I quickly brainstorm what to do. Realize that, if I'm careful, I can cut the assembled sandwich and lay it in the box with the fries in such a way that it will not fall apart. Pleased with myself and my idea, I finish putting the order together and place the closed container in the pass-through window for the server to bag up. As I have no other orders at the moment, I decide to text my general manager, who is scheduled in later in that day, about the frill pick situation and to ask if he can stop and pick some up on his way in. Before I can hit send, I hear a bellow from down the server line. What the heck is this? Immediately on alert, I step around to the server line to see Mr. World Class Jerk glaring at me. He repeats his question, so I ask, what's the problem? Why are there no frill picks in my sandwich? He demands to know. My reply is matter of fact, because we're currently out. Why not? Can't you get an order right? Why can't you do your dang job? Crossing my arms, I quirk an eyebrow and flatly reply that it's my general manager who does our ordering, not me. That I wasn't even aware we were out of frill picks until just now. The server is standing nervously off to the side. She's waiting to see what goes down. Mr. World Class Jerk inhales, sputters a little, then spits out, Well, I can't eat this like it is without the frill picks to hold it together. Not while I'm driving. He thrusts the box into the server's hands. I want each sandwich section wrapped so it doesn't fall apart. Then, muttering under his breath, he steps back out front as the server scurries towards me. She hands me the box. I turn, walk past the grill line into the back kitchen and to the prep table, setting the box down next to the dispenser. Open the lid. You want your sandwich wrapped? You got it. Each individual section, carefully, lovingly wrapped in a four foot long sheet of 18 inch wide food service grade saran wrap. Placing the sandwich back into its box, I walked back up to the server line and handed it off to my coworker. She takes it out front. I see her hand it to this jerk who proceeds to open the lid. He must have been satisfied because he closed the container and exited the restaurant. Walking back onto the grill line, I finish sending my text to my boss and wonder how long it will be before the fallout for my malicious compliance hits. It never did. I don't know if he ever called to complain to my boss. I certainly didn't hear about it, though we never saw that driver come into the restaurant again. Gas company billing issue? Sure. This happened about six years ago when I moved in with my partner at the time. Our realtor managing the property gave us the form and we filled it in. There was a section that asked about us requesting all utilities being connected on our behalf. Gas, power, phone, internet. I ticked the no box because I wanted to choose my own suppliers. We moved in, power was on, gas was on, no internet yet, but that would take days or weeks. But then I realized I never called the gas power company. Crap, I forgot. Though when I rang them and gave them my details, they said, it's all confirmed and connected already. What a coincidence that the utilities the realtor connected us with was the same company I was going to sign up with. Nine months goes by. One day I come home and there's no gas. Power is fine. I call the company. You haven't paid your bills. Now, let me rewind for a moment. Ever since moving in, they never sent us a bill. I requested to receive them via email. Never got one. I checked my spam. But each quarter, our utilities get billed quarterly. I'd get a bill in my letterbox addressed to the previous tenant. I'd mark the envelope RTS, no such name. And each quarter, I would ring the gas company to tell them, got another bill addressed to previous tenant. They'd respond with, oh, okay, let's fix that. Anyway, back to the present day of the story. I'm on the phone trying to explain the gas disconnection issue, explaining that we haven't paid our bill because we never got one, and so on. They look at my account and then ask me to confirm my name. Once again, the previous tenant's name appears. I explain to them that I've sent every bill back to them and called each time to resolve this. They deny it all, never heard from me, no records. So I ask them, is the gas disconnected now? They say yes. I say great. I'd like my gas at this address to be connected under a new customer name, please, because it appears to still be under the previous tenant. They tell me I can't do that. They tell me I'm the previous tenant. So I ask them to confirm my identification. I give them my name. They have zero info about me. I tell them I'm hanging up now. You can call me on the number in your system for this account to confirm things, but go easy on the person who answers because they haven't lived here in nine months. I hang up, ring back immediately. Talk to sales, sign up a new account. Gas connected the following day, got nine months free gas because no one at the gas company would listen to me. 
do this next. Tap here on your screen to come see our new podcast playlist, where you'll find thousands of hours of the best stories you've ever heard. Or tap the one on the right. That episode is specifically just for you, based on other videos you've enjoyed the most.